there is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Replace fifth dimension with fourth dimension, and Rod Serling, the classic host of the beloved Twilight Zone, could have been setting up today's episode. Shaking things up this week and trying something new with today's suck. Little blend of science and superstition, philosophy, and the supernatural. Have you ever had a dream that meant absolutely nothing to you at the time? But then a few days, or weeks, or maybe even months later, something odd happens. You're living your normal life, thinking about nothing out of the ordinary, when suddenly an eerie feeling consumes you. An unmistakable sense of, I've been here before. It takes a while for you to place why you have this feeling. You can't quite figure out where you've seen this before or even what it is that's triggering some memory in the back of your mind. What you're trying to recollect is a little foggy, a little shapeless, but then it hits you. You've dreamt this before. What that person just said to you or the room you've just walked in or the thing you just witnessed, you saw it in a dream some time ago. Maybe you didn't dream about the exact specifics, like what the person was wearing when they spoke or what the furniture and the room looked like, but the core of it, the essentials of it, you saw in your sleep. This experience would fall under the category, for the French, of déjà vu. For spiritualists, it would be classified within the realm of clairvoyance. Many call it nothing more than coincidence, but some call it the result of tapping into the fourth dimension. Building off of mathematician Charles Howard C.W. Hinton's theories on the fourth dimension from the late 1880s, a soldier, aeronautical engineer, pioneering pilot, and philosopher named John William J.W. Dunn conducted a series of tests in order to discover the true nature of these seemingly prophetic dreams just over a century ago, back in the 1920s. In 1927, Dunn published the results of his study and the theory he had developed out of it in his book, An Experiment with Time. As we will later discover, Dunn came to the conclusion that the seemingly prophetic dreams could not be attributed to clairvoyance or telepathy, which were two very popular concepts at the time, nor did he think they could be explained as cases of astral projection or soul wandering. However, he felt strongly that they could also not be reduced to mere coincidence. Dunn came to the conclusion that these apparent night prophecies are actually just your average run-of-the-mill dreams, the kind we have every night. It's just that these dreams are occurring on the wrong night. They are dreams that have been displaced in time because in the fourth dimension, our experience of time is not always linear. And in our sleep, we can access this fourth dimension. Strange, I know. The territory we're going to explore today is strange. It is magical. It also sounds, at quick glance, totally outlandish and ridiculous. Or at least it did to me. But maybe, just maybe, it's possible. We're not just leaning on wackadoodle pseudoscience and half-baked notions pulled out of thin air today. We'll be looking at some real science and also quite a bit of speculation, fascinating speculation built on some science. Today, we're going to explore Dunn's time theory, explain where it comes from and the work that led up to it, conduct a few mini thought experiments, and ultimately wonder if he could be right. Is time really nonlinear? Has the future already happened in the past? Is it happening right now? Where do I go when I sleep? Where do we go when we dream? What the hell does conspiracist David Icke think about all of this? The man who seems to believe he has awakened humanity to the critical threat of a reptilian agenda. Ike has also had some thoughts about the fourth dimension. His thoughts are, not surprisingly, more extreme than Dunn's already out there ideas. But we'll look at his thoughts nonetheless because, well, they're pretty damn funny. And the comments people have left beneath his video, funnier. We'll explore all this and more in this week's time traveling, dream hopping, maybe even ghost proving, reality shattering, metaphysical and philosophical Twilight Zone edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, you beautiful, curious nerds. I hope you're ready to have fun, get weird, as we explore some pretty out there, interesting territory today, the fourth dimension. Uh, Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Suckinator 5000, President, CEO, Secretary, uh, COO, and Sergeant of Arms of the Pat Sajak Fan Club, a weak little baby priest, exorcist assistant, and you are listening to Time Suck. 
Uh, Hail Nimrod, Hail Lucifina. Praise be to good boy Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. No announcements today. One of the things about the fourth dimension is that you can't have top of show announcements in it. Uh, I'm not sure why. It's just uh, they don't vibrate to the right frequency or something. Uh, but I can dedicate this episode to somebody and I will. Today's episode is dedicated to New Hampshire time sucker Kevin Thompson. A uh, very bright light in an often dark world and someone you will meet today at the end of today's time sucker updates if you stick around for that. So stick the fuck around. Uh, and now, if you look at the clock, you'll notice that we're running out of time to talk about time. So it's time we get started. Today, we're leaving this reality behind. We're setting out for the great unknown. Today, we are headed for the fourth dimension. What if I said it like that every time I brought it up? Just got a little little weird. The fourth dimension. (laughs) Although there are quite literally thousands of theories out there that attempt to confront the theoretical reality of the fourth dimension, in this episode, we're going to rely predominantly on the work of two philosophers, a theoretical mathematician, C.W. Hinton's work in the 1880s, an aeronautical engineer and philosopher and a guy who did all kinds of stuff, fly fisherman, uh, J.W. Dunn's work in the 1920s. Uh, Both Hinton and Dunn's work revolve around the idea that the theoretical fourth dimension could in fact be time itself and explore what that means for our understanding of not just dreams, but possibly also our own mortality. And I won't keep calling it theoretical all the time. Uh, String theorists uh, do strongly believe our world encompasses more than three dimensions, But without experiential evidence, the mathematical theory of space and time as a fourth dimension has remained just that, a theory since the days of Albert Einstein. Uh, Today, we'll also touch a little bit on other more scientific theories, theories, excuse me, about the fourth dimension, like Einstein's theory on space-time, but mostly we'll stick with Hinton and Dunn. This is because our goal today isn't to discover how the fourth dimension relates to the physics of the known universe, which is how it is uh, most often employed. Instead, the main objective of today's mission into the fourth dimension is to see how it relates to how cats are able to feed their babies with such teeny, tiny little nipples. They're too small. How do those little cat titties feed anything? And don't even get me started on gerbil nipples. Or the main objective of today's mission into the fourth dimension is to see how it relates to how our own individual lives, uh, you know, here on Earth. Um, We'll also be focusing mostly on these uh, two philosophers because whether or not you realize it, you've probably already been exposed to their theories. The modern concept of the fourth dimension is firmly rooted in the ideas that Hinton and Dunn planted almost a century ago. And their ideas, well, I guess one of them planted over a century ago. And their ideas have not just reverberated in philosophy, even the way the higher dimensions are depicted in today's movies and TV shows are often direct interpretations of their hypotheses, whether or not the creators of those movies and TV shows are even aware of that. For example, remember the Tesseract, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the glowing blue cube that contains a space infinity stone, the one Loki steals in the first Avengers in order to enslave the human race. Well, the Tesseract is actually a real thing, and it was invented uh, by C.W. or C.H. Hinton in 1888. The original Tesseract obviously wasn't a sparkly cube wielded by Norse gods, but a mathematical diagram meant to explain the existence of the fourth dimension. Essentially, Hinton's Tesseract is to a cube What a cube is to a square. It's the representation of one additional dimension. And we'll get into how that works as best we can uh, more a bit later. I found it fascinating. I hope you do too. Uh, We're going to start off today by familiarizing ourselves with the absolute basics of fourth dimensional theory. We'll also get a feel for the cultural environment of Victorian England, which was, you know, where the concept initially started to solidify and gain traction. In honor of J.W. Dunn's belief that time is not linear, today we're doing away with the timeline completely. Time is not real. Or it might not be real. This is all uh, fascinating to me, but also pretty confusing. Uh, it's like Detective Rust Cole said in season one of True Detective. Someone once told me time is a flat circle. Mm-hmm. If everything we've ever done or will do, we're going to do over and over and over again. And that little boy and that little girl, they're going to be in that room. Again. And again. Ugh. And again. Uh, you know, actually, maybe time is not quite like that. That was fucking depressing. Uh, today's exploration of time is not going to center on kids being abducted, sexually abused, or murdered in ritualistic ways, and then somehow, you know, having that happen to them over and over and over and over. Not exactly. 
Uh, but if time is not linear, if the fourth dimension, uh, you know, you, if in it, you can, in a sense, step outside of time, you could access some past moment and then reaccess it and reaccess it again and again and again. And I guess in a way it is just happening over and over again. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. I, oh my God. It's, it's like playing a vinyl record for a few seconds, then lifting the stylus up, dropping it down and replaying it and then doing that again and again and again. Okay, after we lay the groundwork for this fairly confusing, but I think worth it topic, we'll move into Hinton's theories, which were the first of their kind. We'll learn more about the Tesseract and also figure out why his essay, What is the Fourth Dimension? First published in 1886, uh, was nicknamed Ghosts Explained. Yep, ghosts. Talking about them in a bit. Uh, After that, we'll jump forward in time to 1927, where J.W. Dunn takes Hinton's ideas and uses them to explain why sometimes our dreams seem to predict the future. We'll also go over a few of Dunn's thought experiments and outline the steps he suggests anyone can take in order to harness our dreams as tools against time and transcend the boundaries of our third dimensional bodies and minds. So let's experiment with time, shall we? As long as us meat sacks have been traversing Earth, or maybe more accurately, as long as us meat sacks have had the cognitive ability to speculate about our own existence, we have asked the question, why is it so much more challenging to push big objects up into our buttholes than it is to push large objects out of our buttholes. And in addition to that age-old query, we've also asked the question, is there more? Right? It's why we got the fuck out of caves two and a half million years ago. What else, where else could we live? It's why we ditched the hunter-gatherer shtick for agriculture during the Neolithic period. Is there more to live than just uh, our life, than just barely surviving, than constantly having to wander further and further in search of our next meal? What if we could stay in one place and grow our food and maybe work on building dwellings a little more wolf uh, resistant? It's why we came together and built civilizations. Is there more to life than just farming, eating, fucking, and dying? What if we all said art, culture, I don't know, fast food stands? It's why we build churches, temples, mosques. What if there's more to life than what we know of this life? It's why we pray. It's why we write many of the books we write. It's why we go to school. It's why we investigate others' beliefs and go to war for our own. We do all this uh, in pursuit of finding out what is beyond. And for most of us, uh, we're hoping that answer won't be jack squat, shithead. Inquiring into the possible existence of the fourth dimension dates back at least as far as 384 BCE and Greek philosophy. However, it wasn't until the Victorian era that theories about some additional dimension or dimensions really began to take hold of uh, the popular imagination. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Before we move up to the fourth dimension, let's first define our own. As humans, we meet sacks exist in a three-dimensional space. Uh, Most of us, hopefully all of us, know what that means. If you thought you were a two-dimensional being, well, it's fucking weird. Uh, Even weirder, much weirder, is if you actually are somehow a two-dimensional being, since it's literally not possible for something truly two-dimensional to exist in our universe. Uh, Bravo, if you somehow pulled that off. You're, uh, You're quite the trailblazer, and you are alarmingly flat. Like, so flat, you are literally invisible. When someone tries to see you from the side. Uh, The physical world we inhabit and everything in it, including us, has three dimensions. Width, depth, and height. Now, one might argue, well, what about the images and videos on my phone screen? They're not 3D. They're 2D. No, they're fucking not. Shut up. Shut your fucking stupid face up. If you think that's true, you're stupid. Okay? JK, uh, I thought those images and videos were actually truly two-dimensional until like, I don't know, yesterday. I actually thought a lot of stuff was 2D until a few days ago. Uh, And non-scientifically, yeah, a lot of stuff is two-dimensional in the sense of how most of us use and understand that term, right? The images, the videos on your computer or phone screen or TV, they don't have depth in the sense that it doesn't look like they're emerging, popping out of the screen or anything. But as flat as they appear, they do technically have some depth. Everything does, which does make them and everything else technically 3D. How, you ask? Well, if you think back to sixth grade science, you'll remember that everything in the universe is comprised of atoms. And atoms, although they are invisible to our naked eye, they have width, depth, and height. Microscopic width, depth, and height, yes, but still they are three-dimensional all the same. And everything is made up out of atoms, even your flat screen TV. Another way to think about existing in a three-dimensional space is to think about dimensions as directions. For example, in a three-dimensional world like our own, we can move in three directions only, up and down, side to side, forwards and backwards, you know, and variations that pivot, you know, from those, but you get the gist. Uh, 
We are limited to using these directions or combinations of them in order to move about in our spatial reality. The 4th century BCE Greek philosopher Aristotle actually said the same thing in metaphysics, defining a body as that which has dimensions in every way, meaning it had width, depth, and height. Fast forward to 1754 when French mathematician Jean-Laurent de la Lambert uh, wrote, I stated above that it is impossible to conceive more than three dimensions. However, my acquaintance holds that one may look upon duration, time, as a fourth dimension, and that the product of time and solidity is, in a way, a product of four dimensions. And, uh, yeah, uh, sure. No, I, I totally, I totally understood all of that completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this idea that time could be the fourth dimension is very similar to what Einstein would hypothesize in his theory of relativity a century and a half later, in 1916. But in the 18th century, it was disregarded and basically forgotten. That was until 1886 when British mathematician, sci-fi author, and just overall interesting dude, C.H. Hinton, published scientific romances and his theory on the fourth dimension. A few other philosophers and imaginative minds had already written about similar topics as Hinton, you know, over the previous century, but they were largely ignored. Hinton's theory just seems to have come about at the right place and at the right time in order to take hold of the public's imagination. Late Victorian England provided the ideal conditions for a novel and thought-provoking theory like Hinton's to be successful. First and foremost, when it was published, literacy rates were skyrocketing across Britain, especially in the industrial, middle, and lower working classes. Because of this, Hinton's work was accessible to more than just snooty, born-into-wealth, heartless fucking pricks. I probably should have said that their work was accessible to more than just the select few at the highest echelons of society, but you knew what I was talking about. But seriously, until shortly before the time of Hinton's work, uh, most widely read work, the rich were just about the only ones with access to education and newly published literature. Secondly, although we might think about the Victorian era as being particularly modest or conservative, and it was in many ways, it was also a time of fervent, ferg oh my gosh, fervent, come on, come on mouth, uh, progress and change compared to the recent past. Many were sick and tired of the old ways and ready to try out a new way of looking at the world around them. Reformist groups and social movements were sprouting up around the nation. Although they didn't look like the protests we have today, people were fighting against things like gender discrimination, vivisection, which is the dissection of living animals, uh, prostitution, and the government's current uh, lunacy laws, which allowed for the disproportionate institutionalization of women who sought out crazy shit uh, like uh, an education or uh, divorce. In other words, the times they were changing, uh, social conventions were sadly moving away from the good old days when righteous patriarchs who looked a lot like me <laughs> were the only people who had any real rights, right? Uh, when everyone else, like, uh, I don't know, my wife, could easily be fucking forced to submit, right? To bend to my will or be locked up. What a, what a time to be alive, how glorious. And as soon as I finish building my time machine, I'm pretty sure uh, I'm only one or two equations, few screws, maybe a little bit of aluminum foil, which I have completing it right now. I'm out of here. When we traveling back to no later than mid-19th century, when life made sense. I don't think I need to say I'm, I'm kidding about all that, do I? Pretty sad if someone's truly pissed right now. That misogynistic racist bastard's doing what? Good. Get in your time machine. Get out of here, Cummins. Well, there's too many people like you in it. Uh, but for real, a lot of new ideas were floating around a lot more freely than in years past in Victorian England, despite its conservative reputation now. Freeing themselves from the ideological shackles of the past was an ideological priority for many Victorians. So when Hinton came along, speaking about how we cannot passively accept what tradition tells us is the truth about the universe, a lot of people were on board. Uh, additionally, the Victorians fucking love science. After Darwin published On the Origin of Species, proving that we come from animals and are therefore, uh, uh, you know, not custom made as is by God and not currently all the product of a shit ton of inbreeding since Adam and Eve's kids would have had to all fuck each other or their mom to create more kids to populate the planet if humanity truly began with just two people. A crisis of faith ruptured the very cultural fabric of the nation. Darwin's theory was in direct contradiction to what the Church of England and the Catholic Church had long taught, although many were able to reconcile evolution with their belief in God and Jesus by taking a more interpretive view of the Bible, many others were not. And they either thought, fuck science, be gone, Satan. Or they felt the Bible, which tradition taught them was the ultimate unassailable truth, had been disproved. For science, or so science, in a sense, essentially became the new king for many. The scientific process was revered for these folk as the only way to know anything for sure. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody became scientists themselves and were conducting home experiments, but more so that the values of science became the values of society, theory, experiment, 
prove or disprove. In the Victorian era, the known world was constantly expanding and changing. What they were told was certain and true was never certain and true for very long. Catherine Crow, who is a spiritualist and the author of The Night Side of Nature, summarized this period of continual new and exciting changes uh, pretty well in 1847. She said, scarcely a month passes that we hear of some new and important discovery. This burgeoning new cultural attitude with science at the heart of it was also accompanied by the growing spiritualist movement, which dominated Victorian England from the 1860s to just before World War I. Ironically, Victorian spiritualists saw themselves as pillars of the scientific community and completely in line with scientific empiricism. This is because they believed that spiritual phenomena that occurred in the seance room, things like furniture allegedly levitating and phantom voices supposedly being heard and words being written out on a piece of paper after they've been locked in a drawer and people feeling their hair and faces and shoulder touched by what must have been a ghost was scientific proof of the afterlife. So all in all, Hinton's theory was received by a population that was hungry for new ideas and ideologies they could replace uh, the old ones with. Already accustomed to new discoveries about the universe happening fairly regularly, uh, regarded men of science in the highest degree, actually had access to read what those men of science had discovered, and were super into spooky ghost shit. And thus, the theory of the fourth dimension caught fire in Britain, which was pretty fucking cool. There is a door, and if you go through it, you will no longer be bound by the trappings of your three-dimensional linear life. You will be able to see not just the world around you. You will also be able to step outside of your world and freeze time, reverse it, fast forward it, loop it. You will no longer be bound by linear movement. Time no longer only keeps marching forward, but instead it can curve up, down and around. It can move backwards. It can collapse in on itself and also explode outwards in ways only truly conceivable. If you choose to exit, the predictable comforts and pains of your current life and choose to now exist in the fourth dimension. In his 1906 book, The Fourth Dimension, Hinton writes, There is nothing more indefinite and at the same time more real than that which we indicate when we speak of the higher. In our social life, we see it evidenced in a greater complexity of relations. But this complexity is not all. There is, at the same time, a contact with an apprehension of Something more fundamental, more real. Now this higher, how shall we apprehend it? It is generally embraced by our religious faculties, by our idealizing tendency. But the higher existence has two sides. It has a being as well as qualities. And in trying to realize it through our emotions, we are always taking the subjective view. Our attention is always fixed on what we feel, what we think. Is there any way of apprehending the higher after the purely objective method of a natural science? I think that there is. At its very basic, Hinton's theory of the fourth dimension is that it has a very real physical and spatial reality, but one that we cannot perceive because we do not have the faculties to do so. And why not? Because we're three-dimensional beings living in a three-dimensional universe, and therefore we are only able to perceive three-dimensional things. This limited ability of perception is why many advanced mathematicians and string theorists assert that the existence of the fourth dimension remains only a theoretical possibility, despite how sure many of them are of its existence by, quote-unquote, proving its reality with a variety of very advanced equations. But we still can't see it. We can't hear it, taste it, smell it, touch it. Because we literally do not have the physical ability since our senses are only built for three-dimensional life. We can't even conceive fully what the fourth dimension might look like without visualizing it as a 3D space like our own. Even the very notion of visualizing is a three-dimensional concept. We are hardwired to think and process reality only in terms of three dimensions. More than that, Hinton says we are limited by our acceptance of the supposed given truths of the universe. He believes we cannot rely too much on what we are told is the capital T truth. And here he's not saying anything like, fuck authority, don't listen to experts. He's saying that although it's important to listen to the dominant voice, we should also give credence to our own thoughts and instincts as valid sources of information, follow our own curiosity here and there. First essay Hinton wrote on the subject was titled, What is the Fourth Dimension? in 1886. He published the essay alongside five of his other works on theoretical metaphysics in a book called Scientific Romances. Arguably his most important work, today we'll be mostly focusing on that. In the opening of What is the Fourth Dimension, Hinton writes that, 
At the present time, our actions are largely influenced by our theories. We have abandoned the simple and instinctive mode of life of the earlier civilizations for one regulated by the assumptions of our knowledge. Whatever pursuit we are engaged in, we are acting consciously or unconsciously upon some theory, some view of things. And when the limits of daily routine are continually narrowed by the ever-increasing complication of our civilization, it becomes doubly important that not on, that not one only, sorry, it becomes doubly important that not one only, but every kind of thought should be shared in. These are heavy concepts and this motherfucker's writing in 1886. <laughs> uh, Hinton says that the best way to surpass collective thinking, or as he puts it, pass beyond the do domain of practical certainty and of looking into the vast range of possibility is to ask yourself if the scope of knowledge we are told to accept is actually irrationally limited, right? He goes on to say that it is the object of these pages to show that by supposing away certain limitations of the fundamental conditions of existence as we know it, a state of being can be conceived with powers far transcending our own. And what the fuck does that mean? Sounds a little woo-woo, doesn't it? Well, although Hinton's statement contains a lot of the same language that's used, uh, often incorrectly slash nonsensically, by New Age spiritualists, spiritualists slash con, art, con artists. My God, I cannot talk to this. It's driving me crazy. Uh, like Jeff and Shalia Devine, who we covered in the Twin Flames Universe episode, language likes conditions of existence and transcendental powers. Hinton's goals are actually very rooted in scientific rationalism. Uh, his message is that if we allow ourselves to think logically about the universe and consider the fact that perhaps there is more to it than we assume by applying the rational laws of our dimension to a higher one, it's possible to reasonably reach the conclusion that just as we are more powerful than the rest of the creatures on this planet, there are beings out there more powerful than ourselves. Although he never actually defines what those higher dimensional beings could be, in addition to laying the groundwork for Einstein's theory of relativity, Hinton's work has largely been understood as a mathematical explanation for the existence of ghosts and or souls, or at least a possible explanation for their existence. And more on that later. Uh, right now, according to Hinton, what are the limitations that we have to uh, suppose away? In short, we need to consider that our perspective from the third dimension is limited. And if there is a fourth dimension and also fourth dimensional beings, then they would only appear to us, could only appear to us as three dimensional beings, since that's all we can see. Confused? That's okay. Uh, I had to go over all of this uh, many, many times for it to even begin to make sense. To make it all a little clear, let's take, let's take everything down to one dimension. Hinton asks us to imagine a being that exists in a space even more limited than our own. Instead of a three-dimensional world, let's imagine a single, straight, one-dimensional line on which a single, one-dimensional being lives. This being would know what it means to move back and forth, nothing more. It has no concept of up or down, because up or down doesn't exist to it. It can't look up or down, can't look side to side. The only reality is directly ahead or directly behind, literally nothing more. Uh, it's like, kind of like compared to uh, modern video games uh, with rich, immersive worlds with all kinds of movement and, you know, all these different choices. It'd be like, like a Super Mario's. You're like early Mario Brothers, right? But Mario can only move across the screen from left to right. I guess he can move up and down, too. So maybe that's not the best example. He's, he's two-dimensional. But, you know, yeah, it's like that compared to, like, the immersive experience now, in a sense, of, uh, you know, games like, uh, you know, Red Dead Redemption. Uh, Hinton wrote, the whole, the whole of space would be to him but the extension in both directions of the straight line to an infinite distance. This, as rudimentary as it seems, is essentially exactly what Hinton says we do. As we are three-dimensional creatures, we assume that space and its contents must, therefore, be an extension of our three-dimensional world, because that's all we've ever been able to perceive. He writes, The foregoing examples make it clear that beings can be conceived as living in a more limited space than ours. Is there a similar limitation in the space that we know? At the very threshold of arithmetic, an indication of such a limitation meets us. Another way to think about all this is by picturing a two-dimensional being living on a two-dimensional plane. Fucking forget my fucking stupid Mario Brothers bullshit. <laughs> like a sheet of paper. For this example, we'll say that the 2D shape living on the plane is a triangle. Let's say that the 2D plane is infinitely long and wide. The triangle can travel anywhere on the plane by moving forwards and backwards, side to side, or a combination of both. 
So it's able to explore infinitely in any direction it desires, except up or down, of course. That third dimension, not accessible to it. Because it can travel in its own universe perpetually by moving in the directions it knows of, the triangle comes to the conclusion, it's a, it's a pretty smart triangle, uh, that it knows all there is to know about existence. It's, it's kind of a cocky little triangle. The triangle is totally unaware that its perception is actually very restricted. It has no idea that it can't move up or down because the directions of up and down simply do not exist to it. Now let's say a three-dimensional cube is placed on this two-dimensional creature's plane, like a box set down on a sheet of paper. To the cocky little triangle creature, this new cube entity would simply appear only as a square. The triangle would be fucking certain. Nah, I don't know what you're talking about, cube. That's bullshit. That's impossible. You're a square. I can clearly see that you're a square. Right? This is because the triangle is only able to perceive the perimeter at the bottom of the cube, the outline of a 2D square. Hinton writes, a being in this plane would only know solid objects as two-dimensional figures, the shapes namely in which that, you know, intersect the plane his plane. In other words, the two-dimensional being is only able to perceive the three-dimensional being as it exists in relation to itself. Think about it all this way. Mathematically, the cube has three dimensions, length, width, height. The two-dimensional triangle, on the other hand, length and width only. Therefore, it's only able to perceive the length and width of the cube, not its height, because that's all it has itself. We can only perceive what we are programmed to receive. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other things around us right now that we can't see that are very real. You know, in a, another example, there's plenty of 3D, uh, you know, single-celled organisms, bacteria, viruses, all of which have physical mass. All of these things are very real, but we're not programmed to be able to see something that small, right? We can't see them. Fourth dimension takes this concept further, right? We can see microorganisms with the microscope, but we would need to alter our very state of being to be able to see anything that is 40. There's no fucking microscope that's going to make it possible. And this brings us to Hinton's next question. What relations do beings in four dimensions, if they do exist, have with us? If we apply the same logic from the triangle and the cube interaction uh, to ourselves, should a fourth dimensional being intersect our world, we would only be able to perceive three of the higher beings' four dimensions. The fourth would be foreign to us. We, we literally wouldn't be able to process it. Like I alluded to earlier, a popular analysis of Hinton's theory is reading fourth dimensional beings as being synonymous with ghosts, or that at least ghosts could be one type of fourth dimensional being which is not that far of a leap from his actual claim. Uh, fourth dimensional beings, as Hinton describes them, are sentient entities that are not restrained to a three-dimensional body. Furthermore, much like, again, the 2D triangle, only able to perceive the cube as two-dimensional like itself, a fourth dimensional being would appear to us only as something we could recognize and understand. Why do ghosts supposedly flicker into and out of our sight? Why do they appear shadowy or translucent, etc.? Well, maybe they don't actually appear shadowy or translucent. Maybe. Uh, if they do exist, they don't look like people claim to see them at all. Maybe that is, uh, you know, all we're able to see because, uh, their plane of existence superimposed over top of ours is like the cube resting on the paper. You know, we're the triangle. We can only see a limited version of their true appearance. I'll revisit this possibility here in a bit. Interesting to think about though, right? Supposing this is all true. Hinton says that we can logically consider the possibility that there is a fourth dimensional aspect to ourselves, our souls. Right, souls that may reappear to others here on Earth as ghosts, because people often interpret ghosts as, you know, uh, you know, this is somebody who was once alive, and this is some portion of them that doesn't have a physical space in our world now that is continued on in some type of sentient way. Ever thought about the relation between a soul and a ghost? I mean, if a ghost is the person no longer connected to their physical body, now dead and gone, it would make sense that a ghost and soul could not only be connected, you know, but they could be one and the same. It's all pretty fucking trippy, right? I feel like this would be a good episode to listen to a few times while high as fuck. Plenty of crazy concepts to uh, let marinate around and produce little idea explosions in a stoned or psychedelic state of mind. Holy shit, I just figured it out! We just need to shed our 3D meat sack trappings and explore the next 40 plane of existence and dimensions. Fuck, I gotta, I almost had it. Uh, Hinton writes that if there were four dimensional objects, we should only know them as three-dimensional solids, the solids, namely, in which they intersect our space. Why, then, should not the four-dimensional beings be ourselves and our successive states, the passing of them through the three-dimensional space to which our consciousness is currently confined? More simply put, because we live in a three-dimensional world and subsequently can only perceive three-dimensional things, is it possible that we are all fourth-dimensional beings confined to a 3D existence, appearing to each other as 3D meat sacks? 
That is what Hinton is asking us to consider. And again, if you're a little lost, don't worry. We all are at least a little lost with these concepts. What we are doing here is literally trying to picture something that we can't possibly literally fully conceive. And that's a heavy burden to bear. Luckily, Hinton is by no means ignorant to how difficult his theory is to comprehend. He writes that in thinking of these matters, it is normal to struggle with the trappings of our earthly limitations unless you possessed at least an above average intellect. In that case, these concepts should, on no more than a second or third reading, become immediately understandable. If you still continue to struggle, it is because your mind is to the above average mind what the triangle is to the cube. And that's best case. If you are very confused, your mind may be not to the triangle, uh, to the cube, but some small shit stain on the two-dimensional paper the triangle moves about on to the cube. Uh, Hinton, of course, did not write that. Uh, he wrote, you're not shit stain. He wrote, I don't think, he wrote, in thinking of these matters, it is hard to divest ourselves of the habit of visual or tangible illustration. If we think of a man as existing in four dimensions, it is hard to prevent ourselves from conceiving him as prolonged in an already known dimension. So all that we can do is to deny our faculty of judging of the ideal completeness of shapes in four dimensions. What Hinton is saying here, minus all the fucking nerd speak, basically the same thing every philosopher that's ever lived has said. But Socrates maybe said it best when he said, I know that I know nothing. Hinton is telling us that even though the fourth dimension is something that we cannot comprehend, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to at least grasp the basics of what it might be, that we shouldn't passively uh, accept that what we can see and feel and hear is all there is, that we should search for more, that we should stare into the abyss, and when the abyss stares back at us, try and figure out what the fuck we're looking at, or something like that. All we can really do is acknowledge the fact that we are trying to know the unknowable. And despite it being unknowable, forge full speed ahead and see how close we can get to the unknowable all the same. So equipped with an understanding that what we are trying to imagine is unimaginable. Fuck it. Let's keep trying to imagine it. Hail Nimrod. Uh, When we try to picture a fourth dimensional being, Hinton says the image of an infinitely powerful entity whose abilities far transcend our own is what springs to mind for most of us. When trying to picture a fourth dimensional being, we might conjure up the image of an omnipotent ball of energy and light, or some Gandalf the White type wizard, or a colossal leviathan like the Titan from Greek mythology. Anything that we think might encapsulate an immeasurable cosmic force. However, mathematically, Hinton believed that simply uh, did not make sense. He believed that it doesn't make sense that the third dimension where we exist functions according to a strict set of natural and physical laws But the fourth dimension, should it exist, would be bound to nothing. Uh, No regulations, no limitations. Much like we can only move in the directions that a three-dimensional body and world allow us, he believed that a fourth dimensional being would only be able to operate in ways that the physics of its dimension allow. Hinton suggests that we need to picture fourth dimensional beings not as all-powerful gods, but as entities that are just as limited by their dimensions, laws of force and motion as we are. Only they are confined in four directions, Whereas, we're confined in three. He explained it like this. A being existing in four dimensions must then be thought to be as completely bounded in all four directions as we are in three. All that we can say in regard to the possibility of such beings is that we have no experience of motion in four directions. The powers of such beings and their experience would be ampler, but there would be no fundamental difference in the laws of force and motion. If we take the popular route and consider fourth dimensional beings to be synonymous with ghosts, then this part of Hinton's theory would answer the question that so many of us are tormented by. If ghosts are real, why don't they fucking prove it? Well, by Hinton's logic, they can't. They can't prove it. Because we are truly unable, incapable, on any level, to document their existence by the laws of science that govern our 3D world. Because they do not live by those same laws. Again, interesting, right? This shit is interesting as hell to me. But like everyone else, I'm looking at all this, uh, you know, with uh, some degree of my own confirmation bias, a tendency of people to favor information that confirms or strengthens their beliefs or values and is difficult to dislodge once affirmed. I'm biased to some extent by wanting there to be A, a strong theory that supports the possibility of ghosts and B, a theory that also offers a reason why the existence of ghosts is perhaps impossible to be scientifically proven, at least with the current trappings of our existing scientific limitations. All right, let's return to that two-dimensional plane example for uh, a second, to further the possibility of the fourth dimension. (laughs) As I said before, uh, the 3D cube 
can rest on the plane and therefore make itself visible to the 2D triangle, but only visible to the extent that the 2D triangle can perceive it, which is, of course, as a square. The cube is not able to transcend the laws of physics in order to make the triangle perceive it in its entirety, just as the triangle is unable to violate laws of physics in order to see in a direction that does not exist to it. Let's now apply this logic to the third and fourth dimensions. If fourth dimensional beings are ghosts, then even if they intercept our dimension, we would not be able to see them in their entirety. They wouldn't be able to magically appear to us as a uh, fourth dimensional because we don't have the faculty to see the fourth dimension. Furthermore, should the cube exit the 2D plane, it would do so by lifting itself off it just to send upwards. However, because the triangle lacks the ability to perceive up, it would just seem to it that there was a square there one second and then the next nanosecond is just gone completely. Similarly, should a fourth dimensional being intercept a third dimensional world, it would, according to Dunn, uh, it would appear suddenly as a complete and finite body and as suddenly disappear, leaving no trace of himself in space in the same way that anything lying on a flat surface would on being lifted suddenly vanish out of the cognizance of beings whose consciousness was confined to the plane. The object would not vanish by moving in any direction, but disappear instantly as a whole. There would be no barrier, no confinement of our devising that would not be perfectly open to him. He would come and go at pleasure. He would be able to perform feats of the most surprising kind. What does that sound like to you guys? To me, the description sounds like a lot of the reports of ghost sightings that, uh, you know, we cover frequently on Scared to Death. Uh, that idea of a paranormal entity appearing as a whole being, then disappearing without a trace. That's something that comes up, you know, uh, a lot in any discussion about the paranormal. And what I find fascinating here is that uh, Hinton is using mathematical reasoning to come up with an answer that can, at least in my opinion, you know, explain the phenomenon, possibly. Uh, in fact, as difficult as it can be to follow, much of what Hinton theorizes uh, in attempting to rationalize the fourth dimension conceptually makes perfect sense. However, as many of you have probably pointed out while listening to this, the metaphor of the two-dimensional plane and the two-dimensional triangle living on top of it falls short in a lot of ways. It's hard to get past the glaring issue of this thought experiment. That is, for two-dimensional beings to exist on a two-dimensional plane, both the beings and the plane have to have some sort of thickness to their form in order to rest one atop the other. As Hinton puts it, every portion of matter is of three dimensions. If we consider beings on a plane not as mere idealities, we must suppose them to be of some thickness. Therefore, if they have any thickness at all to them, they're not two-dimensional. And they have three-dimensional shape because they have height as well as width and length, which means it's impossible for anything that's less than three dimensions to exist. In other words, it's impossible for the second dimension to exist because a third dimension exists. And if that's so, that means that the second dimension exists only as a hypothetical or figment of our thought process. So if the second dimension only exists in our minds in true Hinton fashion, let's apply that logic one dimension up. If we assume the fourth dimension exists, Hinton argues that that could mean one of the two following possibilities regarding our own existence. You're ready to have your fucking minds more blown. In the first possibility, it could mean that we are three-dimensional beings only and just like the second dimension cannot exist except as a figurative hypothetical, if there is a third, then we cannot exist except as a figurative hypothetical if there is a fourth. He writes that, I know this is crazy shit. He writes that if we are in three dimensions only, while well, there are really four dimensions, then we must be relative to those beings who exist in four dimensions as lines and planes are in relation to us. That is, we must be mere abstractions. In this case, we must exist only in the mind of the being that conceives us and our experience must be merely the thoughts of his mind. Fuck. None of this is real. You're not real. I'm not real. This podcast is not real. We're in a simulation. Life is truly just a game. And we are just video game characters programmed to think we are real for some higher beings amusement. Note to self, I actually can't think about this episode if I get too fucking high. It's going to destroy my brain. In the second possibility, if we are not simply figures of some greater being's imagination, then that could mean that we actually have a fourth dimensional existence. In other words, it means that we do have souls. Or at least it could mean that. Hinton believed that reality was one of these two possibilities, right? Uh, you know, he believed in the possibility of the second option because uh, if the fourth dimension exists, then we have to reasonably assume that we are a part of it. Otherwise, it would be impossible for us to exist at all. Duh. Okay. Now, I know all this is very baffling, but again, Hinton would argue that, you know, that which is baffling is what we should actively seek out the most. He ends his article, uh, What is the Fourth Dimension, by reiterating just how vital it is for us to carry out these types of complex thought experiments and urges us 
not to be passive bystanders to our own existence, but to attempt to find out the truth for ourselves, to attempt to imagine the unimaginable. This type of thinking enables us to express, he wrote, in intelligible terms, things of which we can form no image. They supply us, as it were, with scaffolding, which the mind can make use of in building its own conceptions. Thus, we may discuss and draw perfectly legitimate conclusions with regard to unimaginable things. It is, of course, evident that these speculations present no point of direct contact with fact, present no point of direct contact with fact, but this is no reason why they should be abandoned. The course of knowledge is like the flow of some mighty river, which passing through the rich lowlands gathers into itself the contributions from every valley. Such a river may well be joined by a mountain stream, which passing with difficulty along the barren highlands, flings itself into the greater river down some precipitous descent, exhibiting at the moment of its union the spectacle of the utmost beauty of which the river system is capable. And such a stream is no inapt symbol of a line of mathematical thought, which passing through difficult and abstract regions, sacrifices for the sake of its crystalline clearness, the richness that comes to the more concrete studies. Such a course may end fruitlessly, for it may never join the main course of observation and experiment. But if it gains its way to the great stream of knowledge, it affords at the moment of its union the spectacle of the greatest intellectual beauty and adds somewhat of force and mysterious capability to the onward current. So even if you don't fucking get it right, you might push things forward nonetheless and push somebody else towards getting it right. That's what I took away from that. (laughs) Uh, When he was eight years old, a young Albert Einstein read Hinton's theory. 16 years later, 1905, he would publish his theory of special relativity his explanation of how speed impacts mass, space, and time. Ten years after that, in 1915, Einstein would publish his theory of general relativity, in which he proposed that time is the fourth dimension. However, four years after that, he married his first cousin, Elsa, who actually share even more genetic similarities with him than a normal first cousin, since while their mothers were sisters, their fathers were also first cousins. So, should we trust anything when it comes from the cousin-fucking son of a cousin-fucker? Kidding. About the trust part. Uh, Not kidding about Einstein and his first cousin fucking family. Uh, Hinton, although history has largely cast him aside, was a fundamental, uh, you know, or was fundamental in paving the way for Einstein's theory. Without him, we might not have had the same understanding of the universe that we do now. Yeah, we might not have it. My brain is mushing. Uh, In the late Victorian era, he was the first to popularize the novel idea that there could be a fourth dimension at all, paving the way for later philosophers and scientists alike to explore the same terrain. One of those philosophers was J.W. Dunn, and he would take the fourth dimension to a place few had gone before, to our dreams, before we get even weirder, but I think even, uh, maybe even have more fun, and talk about the intersection of dreams and the fourth dimension. Let's take a brain break and hear what conspiracist David Icke has to say about the fourth dimension in a video called The Cabal, The Fourth Dimension, and The Simulation. David Icke posted by the Inspired YouTube channel, August 13th, 2022, in today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. 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 Uh, This video, since it's only seven minutes and 37 seconds long, uh, I'm going to play it in its entirety, and uh, I'll react to Ike's statements here and there, and then we'll see what kind of comments uh, some Ike's fans have left below the video. Dramatic... Ocean scene, soothing music, David Icke. The biggest trap that researchers and seekers of truth can fall into is reaching at any point the idea that they've got it. Hmm? We're not awake. We're awakening. So when people say, I woke up, yes, okay. But you're still awakening after that. Because as Socrates said in ancient Greece, or was supposed to have done, wisdom is knowing how little we know. So I've always gone on that basis that whatever we think we know, there's always more to know. I mean, that's the big truth that's without question true. And so I've gone on going deeper in the rabbit hole Mm -hmm. and asking where all this is coming from what's going on in the world today. Hmm. Because I concluded a very long time ago, back in the 1990s, when I was researching this and putting together the names, dates, places, level of information. Uh, It kind of bothers me that so far, I kind of like what he's saying. (laughs) I I didn't think I'd be able to go this far into a video and be like, 
No, that actually sounds really, really great. He's actually giving off real strong uh, Cult of Curious vibes. Okay. But there's no way it could be orchestrated purely by people sitting around the table deciding their next move. Hmm. It's much bigger than that. So how big? Hmm. Um, where does it go? Where does it come from? So he's going to pivot and here. The sequence of my life since I had my initial head blown off awakening in 1990, 1991. What he's talking about there is when he went on this uh, this British uh, talk show and, <laughs> and was severely mocked for wearing this uh, kind of aqua marine, turquoise, I guess, colored tracksuit and uh, explained to the audience that he was the godhead. And before that, he'd been a BBC sports broadcaster. That, that's where David Icke pivoted into the conspiracist he is now. It was a pursuit of where this came from and it was the knowledge that mm -hmm. what we see and therefore think we know about what's going on uh -huh. is only a fractional part of what there is to know so what i've done over the last 32 years okay. is span out from just the daily news of events and what's happening, what Klaus Schwab has said or Gates has said or any of these people. Huh? Huh? And I want to know what's behind them. And so I've been on this journey going deeper and deeper in the rabbit hole. And okay. I realized that beyond the, what I call the global cult, the global oh, secret go. society network, here we go. which this is all orchestrated, uh -huh. was a non-human force. There we go. That was manipulating human society to its own ends. Love it. Ah, that's the Ike I know. There's, there, there he is. <laughs> these guys, uh, oh, we, I used to talk about this all the time when the secrets suck. I, I love it when these guys uh, do this. They will start off talking about things that uh, are fairly reasonable. You know, like there's more to life than meets the eye. We should all be continually awakening. And uh, what if there's this higher level of consciousness? Except they don't say like what? It's always like there's this higher level of consciousness, like with certainty. And then there's always a pivot. Uh, and it just goes right, just sa same tone, you know, like it makes just as much sense. And there's a non-human conspiracy behind everything. Like just stated as if, like, un it's unquestionable. You know, there's a higher level of consciousness out there, which means <laughs> if you look at Bill Gates combined with that, there's this nefarious cabal of you know, global controllers. And I think that... Absolutely, since the COVID era began, uh -huh. more and more people have started to realize that the agenda that's unfolding is anti-human. Yeah, more and more people Every are area agendas, of that's life sure. that is essential to humans, whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's the atmosphere that's being changed by technologically generated radiation, uh -huh. even the nature of the body being manipulated all these different essential areas of human mm -hmm. life are being targeted and thus it's an anti-human agenda this also cracks me up uh when they get talk about how like look at all the signs everything that's happening now it reminds me of like doomsday preachers you know everything's happening now and with with ike you know his the background here of what his beliefs are is that he believes his reptilians have been around for thousands and thousands of years like highly intelligent you know, beings that live on a different dimensional frequency, you know, far more powerful than us. And and they've hated humanity the whole time and been trying to destroy us. But it's taken them thousands of years to really kind of get started. Like, why didn't they destroy us thousands of years ago? And, why, and if they're so powerful, why don't they just fucking wipe us out like right away? But instead, they got to like poison us through supposed like 5G cell phone <laughs> signals and fucking chemtrails. And this, you know, sneaky Bill Gates agenda. It's like... What? How, how can they be all powerful and also so inept when it comes to getting rid of us at the same time? Like, like, why is there more people on Earth than ever? If you know they're they're poisoning us, they're killing us, they're getting rid of us. Like, why does why does the population keep increasing? And a lot more people than ever before, far more, are starting to say, "Well, well, maybe that's because," as that mad guy Ike says. Behind this is a non-human force. And I guess to start is to go back to just after the turn of the millennium. Sorry, just really quick again. 
I like how he's making it sound smarter in this by he refers to a non-human force. I mean, that that sounds, I don't know, like just more po- like it, so- it sounds less crazy than if he would just say what he believes, which is lizard people. Like, like if he says, replace non-human force with lizard people and he immediately sounds like a fucking crackpot to at least, you know, more people. When I, I just got so powerfully, you know, a, a kind of knowing that we live in a simulation. Huh. The technologically massively advanced version of a, a virtual reality computer game. What we call the laws of physics are actually the rules of the simulation that have been encoded into it. You can encode whatever rules and laws that you want in your game. This is also interesting to me because, you know, simulation theory, I'm fascinated by. But it's like, okay, if we are these little avatars or whatever, or fucking it's very matrixy. But like, if we're, if we're, if we're just like these little uh, people in this video game, then just like I can just take my game and fucking smash it. Like, if I want to get rid of the characters in the game, I can just fucking smash it. I can smash it to bits. And then those characters, or like the computer programmers who made the game originally, I don't know, put a fucking virus into the game that just anytime somebody tries to play it, it just wipes it out. It just fucking cleans the slate. It's like, what is the point of trying to fight back if we are in a simulation? It's like, yeah, the people that control the simulation are so much more advanced. They don't give a fuck if we're trying to rebel. They can just easily just smite the shit out of us. Like that's, that's not an entity you can fight back against. But you're still going to be limited by the processing speed of the computer system or whatever you're working with. And that's the speed of light. So I was long exploring this side of things. Mm -hmm. And then in the last couple of years, a lot of things have been happening to me (laughs) that have been pointing me in a very clear direction. Okay. And it's this. Uh If we break up the different levels of reality and let's call this Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what we call the human world i'm listening let's call it the third dimension okay there are other dimensions beyond that now people often when they think Mm -hmm. of other dimensions they think well other dimensions are way out there and of course in frequency terms they are way out there (laughs) of course (laughs) this is a low frequency world obviously but there are other frequency bands Mm -hmm. call them dimensions okay which are very much closer to this one. And there's one which the spiritual arena and ancient cultures, they call it the astral. Mm, astral plane. They call it the fourth dimension. Okay. And then there's beyond that, the fifth dimension. Huh, no shit. Okay. And that is beyond the simulation. Oh. That is outside the simulation. So if you okay. awaken, this uh-huh. is what I think awakening is. Yeah. If you awaken to expand your consciousness, mm-hmm. Beyond the third dimension, beyond the fourth dimension, yeah. you're then tapping okay. in to information, knowledge, awareness, oh, knowing shit. that is not being tampered with by the simulation. Oh. And that's what we call waking up. That's when people start <laughs> to see things. Why didn't I see it before? Because you were within the simulated, manipulated reality before. So what this series of amazing synchronicities in my life in the last two years have yeah. pointed me to is that this reality we can see is being manipulated and this simulation controlled by and uh-huh. created by and projected from the lower levels of the fourth dimension, the lower astral. And the lower astral yeah is the realm of demons, demonic consciousness, distorted consciousness. (laughs) For sure. People call lost souls. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. It's very low vibrational. It's very dark. It's very confusing. And it's very chaotic. Mm -hmm. Which means that this cult... (laughs) He's almost done. ...that Mm -hmm. I've been exposing... This cult, yeah. Mm -hmm. ...which is behind world events and the direction of the world and the chaos that's unfolding... Fuck yeah, bro. ...is actually an extension an expression of this lower astral consciousness Uh and the entities that reside there. Okay. Well, there you have it. There you have it. That was just a little teaser. You (laughs) get, that was a teaser of a full interview that I think is a couple hours long. You you know what? Okay. I know we've been already talking about a bunch of weird shit here. And so you might think, well, that wasn't that much weirder 
than what we've been talking about. It's the certainty of people like Ike that bothered me so much. The, just the, the way the information is presented, just this absolute knowledge, you know, absolutely knowing unknowable things. He can think all that shit's true, but purely hypothetical. Also bothers me that he clearly has watched The Matrix like fucking 50 times. <laughs> and a lot of this is just like, dude, you're just talking about the matrix. Uh, but he doesn't back up his assertions with scientific theories or thought experiments. He, like he, he just, he just says shit. Here's some, here's some shit. Here's some facts that I just made up, uh, or speculations that I'm presenting as facts. Okay. Now let's see what other people who heard all of that thought at Risa Johnston, eight, six, one posted. Yes. The demonic entities in the other dimensions can attach themselves to humans influencing our third eye vision. The pineal gland area, back of the neck, our decision-making process, etc. It blocks us from receiving universal light and wisdom, holds us back from moving forward and manifesting goals, a spiritual battle between the light and the dark. Humans have choices to make at every crossroad, always ask for the highest guidance and protection every day. And then a little kiss, a little X. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we're uh, under demonic attack constantly. Well, how do we protect ourselves? Well, somebody has the answer underneath that comment. At F the Matrix. Mm, fuck the Matrix, uh-huh. They have the answer. They wrote, big time. And keep that pineal gland activated by using apple cider vinegar. Add sprouts to your diet. You can grow them in a jar. Listen to different frequencies on YouTube, like Meditative Mind Channel. Has lots of music for pineal gland. Uh, God bless. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you don't want a bunch of fucking demonic entities uh, attaching themselves to your third eye, you, you gotta eat a lot of sprouts. And you got to drink a lot of apple cider vinegar. There, well, there you go. You know, fucking wow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed that. That's an interesting life hack. But you, but you got to be careful not to deactivate your pineal gland by drinking water with fluoride in it or uh, brushing your teeth with fluoride in the toothpaste. A lot of replies about that. Uh, next comment here at um, Jean Contact E. Uh, some kind of alien re- reference there. Uh, they agree with everything David just said. However, they've been having a real hard time getting others <laughs> on board with this shit. They posted, it's called a planetary consciousness simulation. I've been approaching, this is my favorite sense. I've been approaching researchers for 15 years and not one of them were interested in the subject. <laughs> I literally pictured this person putting on an actual fucking hat made out of tinfoil and just pushing their, just fucking crazy eyed, like hair going in every direction, like just dirty, just fucking stinky. And they push their way into just one research facility after, I know, just let me talk to the scientists. No, just let me, they got to look into my planetary conscious simulation. Get your hands off me. You're hurting me. I, God damn it, you reptilians. And then just literally gets thrown out onto the fucking concrete in front of the facility by security. Just 15 straight years of that. Every time these videos pop up, he's like, I know. I've been telling everybody. Uh, at serious doubt, not only believes in the fourth dimension, they know how to get there. So that's pretty fucking dope. Uh, roughly, they know, they know roughly where a portal is to get there. I'll let them explain. They write, the gate to the fourth dimension is in, (laughs) I just love again, the third, the gate to the fourth dimension is in Scandinavia at the bottom of the Baltic sea near the anomaly. There also is a gate, like a Gothic window. Uh, the Baltic sea anomaly is a feature visible on an indistinct sonar image taken by Peter Lindbergh, Dennis Auberg, and their Swedish Ocean X diving team while treasure hunting on the floor of the Northern Baltic Sea at the center of the Gulf of the Gulf of uh, Bothnia in June 2011. Well, there you fucking have it, right? It's t- I think it's about high time. Uh, we put an expedition together and explore the fourth dimension to determine once and for all what exactly is going on there. Let's fucking go! What is this thing, really? Uh, scientists in recent years have stated that this strange looking sonar image this person's referring to this Baltic sea anomaly, very likely, almost certainly a massive volcanic rock deposited on the sea floor by a big Scandinavian glacier. So it looks out of place because the rock didn't used to be there and it freaks people out and it happens to be shaped a lot like the millennium Falcon, actually, uh, at Jamaica tech chaos, nine, nine, seven, two. They're not buying this shit, at least not the Scandinavian part. They posted, ah, I thought Antarctica. <laughs> and then Ant, and then at Arcasia, uh, wants some confirmation posting. What makes you so sure? No reply. A little suspicious. Uh, at Rebecca Whitney, three, five, three, nine, also a fan of David's thoughts as a second generation chiropractor. She is very worried about humanity. Rebecca posts. Thank you, David. As a second generation chiropractor. <laughs> That's just a fucking weird way. 
to start almost any conversation. As a second generation chiropractor, I'll have you know. Uh, as a second generation chiropractor, I have been only too aware of the dark forces that have tried to destroy humanity. Our disastrous state of health, physic- <laughs> physically, mentally, and spiritually, are a reflection of this infiltration. The medical industrial complex is imploding on itself. And I look forward to helping to rebuilding our healthcare system based on individual sovereignty and bodily autonomy. Why don't you shut the fuck up, right? You're not actually a real doctor. <laughs> Sorry, chiropractors, but you're not the same as a fucking medical doctor. Lots to unpack there. Uh, don't even want to try and unpack it. I just included it because of her second generation chiropractor reference. How the fuck does that make her an expert in dark forces trying to destroy humanity? Nobody knows more about dark forces trying to destroy humanity than me and my dad. I'm a second generation chiropractor. He told me about it growing up and I've seen it firsthand myself. Uh, <laughs> I thought chiropractors were healthcare professionals who would use their hands to examine and treat problems of you know bones, muscles, joints, spinal adjustments. No idea. They were regularly fucking battling dark forces. Maybe that's what they do when they crack your neck. They're releasing the dark forces that are spiritually attacking you. Finally, not only does <laughs> at Julianne Dotton 663 believe David's discussion about not just the fourth dimension, but also the fifth dimension, she is living fucking proof. The shit is real, you guys. She posted, as someone who has been gratefully, all caps, <laughs> in the fifth dimension, For a minute now, (laughs) I cannot be more appreciative of this video clip. And I'm going to listen to David's entire interview as he is one of the people who assisted in my beginning awakening. But I do have a question about the end of this conversation. If anyone knows and can please chime in. Do you think when he speaks of the dark, demonic, confusing mess, etc., he is speaking of the third dimension that we are living in or even lower dimensions? Fucking wait. No, I thought you were in the fifth dimension. What? How, How are you in the third? I'm confused. (laughs) <laughs> how 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 do you as an elevated being literally in the fifth dimension not know what the fuck is going on in third dimension it, god you know it's almost like it's almost like all these people are just playing some game of wackadoodle word salad mad lips and don't have a fucking clue what they're talking about uh how did she get to the fifth dimension she must have been on one hell of a journey right she clearly dived down to that fourth dimension portal at the bottom of the baltic sea traveled through the gothic window And then God knows what she had to do to find a door to the fifth dimension. Probably had to battle fucking dragons, fight a necromancer or two. And I probably need to get back to our slightly less weird subject matter uh, (laughs) here today. Idiots of the internet. Okay, after what was hopefully a fun little brain break. Let's get back to exploring uh, another fourth dimension theory. Uh, that is, I'll admit, you know, just about as nuts as thinking that there was a door to, uh, the fourth dimension on the Baltic sea floor, but J.W. Dunn, I do think makes a better argument for what the possibility he's proposing, uh, here is like the reality of this possibility than David Icke has made an argument for literally anything ever. J.W. Dunn's theory of time and dreams hinges on the idea, definitely a little far-fetched of precognition. According to Britannica, the precognition is the supernormal knowledge of future events with emphasis not upon mentally causing events to occur, but upon predicting those occurrence of which the subject claims has already been determined. Dunn would disagree. Uh, He uses the term precognition not to describe a supernatural or paranormal glimpse of the future, but to describe the normal, supernormal, synonym for exceptional, experience had by everyone when they dream. And he created his theory based on the work of Hinton and Einstein. As we know, Hinton believed we are fourth dimensional beings that are limited by our three dimensional bodies and perceptions. We are confined to seeing and experiencing the universe in a three dimensional way because our faculties are only able to perceive three dimensions. If Hinton is right, when uh, is the only time, when is the only time that our three dimensional limitations or as Dunn puts it, our mentally imposed barriers might be broken down and weakened enough for us to see something in a very new way. Uh, When we are asleep. When sleeping, our consciousness is still at work, but our bodies and minds are in a divergent state, different than when we are awake. We are, in a sense, Dunn's beliefs, not necessarily mine, freed from our three-dimensional thought shackles. So based on that interesting idea, if Einstein is also right in saying that time is the fourth dimension, then that would mean that while we are asleep, we are experiencing time, possibly, as it truly is. Although neither philosopher talks about this, you could also apply their theories to the use of psychedelics and say that, uh, you know, uh, Uh, That's another time. Our three-dimensional limitations of perceptions are broken down 
you know, when we're hallucinating. I feel like I might have entered the fourth, if not fifth or sixth dimension when I was already pretty high in LSD and magic mushrooms and then did a few cycles of DMT. Not sure where my mind was during those DMT spikes. Kind of fucking blacked out for a few minutes. Pretty sure I was not in this plane of existence. There's at least a small chance my consciousness may have been with at Julianne Dotton 663 somewhere. Fighting dragons, battling necromancers. Uh, Time Dunn says is not chronological. It does not follow along a single straight and rigid path. We only think that it does because that is the only way our three-dimensional existence allows us to experience time. Uh, Just like the 2D triangle would only be able to perceive the cube as a 2D square, we are only able to experience a four-dimensional thing, time, in a three-dimensional way, which is in a linear fashion. When we see the future in our dreams, it's not that anything spectacular is happening to us, Don asserts. It's just that obstructions of our everyday existences are cleared and we're able to experience more than just our three-dimensional world. Kind of like what happens when we eat enough sprouts and drink enough apple cider vinegar to fucking really get that third eye humming, right? Vibrating at the highest possible frequency. Sorry, I'll stop linking Dunn's thoughts to Ike's. Uh, It's confusing enough without me fucking it up. Refocusing. And again, don't worry if this is uh, a little convoluted. It is inherently a bit confusing. But I'll explain uh, all this in more detail to make it at least a little less confusing. Before sharing more of Dunn's dream thoughts, let's travel to 1927 to meet him. Actually, let's travel to 1875 when he's born. John William Dunn, born on December 2nd, 1875, on a military base called uh, Curra Camp in County Kildare, Ireland, where his father, General Sir John Dunn, was stationed at the time. Although a born Irishman, his mother was English, and he subsequently spent his childhood and most of his adult life in England. As a child, he was insatiably curious. He once sustained an unknown injury that left him bedridden for some time, and it was the long hours he spent alone while recovering that first sparked his interest in time. He once asked his nurse about time, what it actually was. She told him the time is how we are moving from yesterday to today and then onwards into tomorrow and into the future. Upon reflection, Dunn said that that answer didn't satisfy him, only sparked more questions. He wondered, which did she mean was time, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or the time which it took us to travel from one to the other? Dunn would spend the rest of his life searching for the answer, and by the time he died in 1949, he felt like he had found it or was at least very close to finding it. Like his father before him, Dunn originally was a military man. At the end of the 19th century, he volunteered as a common mounted trooper in the Second Boer War, which was a conflict between the Boer Republics in South Africa and the British Empire. A conflict fought mostly over massive gold reserves in South Africa, and a conflict the empire would win. However, before he could see the colonizers' victory in 1902, in 1900, Dunn contracted typhoid fever and was discharged on army sick leave. While back in Britain and recovering, he began to study flight. He was inspired by the fiction of author Jules Verne and the ineffective observation balloons he had seen deployed in the army. An observation balloon at the time was similar to today's hot air balloon, with a military spy or observer sitting in the basket trying to gather aerial information about the enemy's movements. However, the actual balloon was filled with hydrogen gas and sealed closed, so it was incredibly flammable, very faulty. Encouraged by his friend H.G. Wells, the dude who would go on to write The War of the Worlds, The Island of Dr. Moreau, over 50 other novels and dozens of short stories and be called the father of science fiction. He spent his time at home conducting tests of different flight models, all of which failed. During this period, Dunn was also obsessed with a dream that he had one night when he was just 13 years old, when he'd been flying a machine that required no steering. In 1902, he was called back to serve another tour in South Africa, this time as a second lieutenant. He was only there until 1903 when he fell ill again and was sent home again. Back in Britain once more, Dunn continued to study of flight with particular interest in creating something that had inherent aerodynamic stability. By 1910, he developed the world's first demonstrable stable aircraft called the Dunn Point Five or the D-5. The aircraft was a tailless biplane and had a swept wing design. It was so stable that Dunn was able to take his hands off the steering and jot down some notes on a piece of paper while in flight. One of the official observers of this demonstration was Orville Wright, who along with his brother Wilbur, I've heard of him, Uh, had invented the world's first successful motorized airplane in 1906. By 1913, the world had its share of stable aircrafts and Dunn was forced to retire from flying due to his poor health. He then redirected his focus to something much less dangerous, dry fly fishing. Hard left turn. Went from building aeronautical prototypes to uh, dry flies. His 1924 book, Sunshine and the Dry Fly, still bought by fly fishermen today. I love it. This dude was smart and eccentric as hell. 
Dune, inv- Dune uh, or Dunn, excuse me, invented new methods for the most effective ways to fly fish and designed fake flies on hooks that were painted white to reflect the sunlight and thus better attract the fish. And throughout all of this, from being a soldier to designing airplanes to uh, studying fish, Dunn never stopped thinking about the question that had haunted him as a child. Why is it so much more challenging to push big objects up into our buttholes than it is to push large objects out of our buttholes? Or the question that haunted him was, what is time? After years of experimentation and meticulously recording his own dreams, Dunn published an experiment with time in 1927. English playwright J.B. Priestley, who wrote multiple productions, including Time and the Conways, and An Inspector Calls, based on, at least in part on Dunn's theories, once said that, quote, those of us who are time haunted owe him an enormous debt. What he means by this is that for those of us who can't think about existence for too long or too deeply without descending into a fucking mad rabbit hole of panic and questions and frustration because the questions we have are impossible to answer, questions like what does it truly mean to live and to go from today to tomorrow to the next day after that if time is not actually truly linear, if there's an afterlife, if I die today, will it forever be today for me when I am dead because if I'm dead, how can there be a tomorrow? For those of us who are tormented by thoughts like these, Dunn's work can offer solace. Not because it explains everything, or even that explains anything for sure, but because it gives us a way to experiment and attempt to solve for ourselves what he calls the problem of time. To get us into the philosophical headspace, an experiment with time starts out with the brain teaser of sorts. And I really like this one. Suppose that you are hosting a visitor from some country where all of the people that live there are born blind, and you are trying to get him to understand what you mean by the word seen. Luckily, both of you are well-versed in and comprehend completely all the meanings of all the scientific and technical expressions you use to try and get it across what it means to see. Just fucking go with this. You're a scientific sight expert, okay? No one has ever known anything more about sight than you, and this person uh, has the ability to comprehend anything science-based. Dunn writes, Using this grounds of mutual understanding, you endeavor to explain your point. You describe how. In that little camera, which we call the eye, certain electromagnetic waves radiating from a distant object are focused onto the retina and there are, uh, and there produce physical changes over the area affected. How these changes are associated with currents of nervous energy in the crisscross of nerves leading to the brain centers and how molecular or atomic changes at those centers suffice to provide the seer with the registration of the distant object's outline. Your visitor understands all that shit. However, what you've given him is merely a description of the physical process, not what it actually means to see, because there is so much more to sight than the scientific words behind it. So, now that he has the knowledge of the how, so to speak, you move on to the what of the issue and try to describe color. In some, you say that each color gives off a different wavelength, and the brain and the eye work together to register the differences in lengths and thus perceive the different colors. Again, he understands completely how this process would lead a person with the ability to see uh, to see different colors. And you could leave it at that and send him on his way. He would depart thinking that your description in the language of physics provided him the information that's equal to the knowledge of what sight is that a person with the ability to see has. For instance, now that he understands what electromagnetic wavelengths the color red gives off and how the eye and brain function and tandem to perceive it, he knows what the color red is in an academic sense. But of course, he doesn't really know Not in the way something with sight knows, knowing how red works versus actually experiencing what red is, knowing what something having the characteristics of redness is are not the same. So your job's not over. Now you decide to try and describe redness, but you'll soon find that any description you might offer of what redness is, is futile in your situation because to understand the description, he would already have to possess the faculties to see, right? There truly aren't enough words to describe it. Your vocabulary can't match your senses. You could describe a sunset or a poppy or a Lucifina's bright red lipstick or a barn or a stop sign, but none of it would fully encompass what it means to say, sit atop a hill at sunset on a partly cloudy summer's day and truly witness the glory of all the different beautiful tones of red highlighting the edges of clouds, filling the horizon with a vast spectrum of different red hues separated by the most minuscule degrees of saturation. Dunn writes that you might keep trying to describe redness physicality until exhaustion supervened. Uh, which the, while the blind man nodded and smiled appreciation, but it is obvious that at the end of it all, He would have no more suspicion of what it is that you might immediately experience when you look at a poppy field 
than he had at the outset of your conversation. This is because physical description is not a substitute for actual experience. Dunn continues with, Now, redness may not be a thing, but it is certainly a fact. Look around you. It is one of the most staring facts in existence. It challenges you everywhere, demanding, clamoring to be accounted for. And the language of physics is fundamentally unadapted to the task of rendering that account. And yes, he said staring facts in existence. I triple checked to make sure staring was not a typo there. I had not uh, seen the word used in quite that context before, but that's what he meant. Uh, Once we realize that the language of physics is fundamentally unadapted to the task of conveying color, for example, Dunn says, we can then logically come to the conclusion that color is not the only fact of the universe that physics cannot properly account for. You could describe color in scientific terms for hours and hours and hours, but the truth is, unless someone has the facilities, the faculties to actually see, uh, color would remain completely unimaginable. This is the crux of Dunn's argument for something like the fourth dimension. Just because physics cannot account for it does not mean it doesn't exist. However, Dunn is still very much uh, a scientific man, which is part of the reason why an experiment with time was so well received by the public. He was a man of science. So he was a man people felt like they could trust. Anyway, because he wanted this book to be accessible to many, especially those without a formal education or an education whatsoever, Dunn provides the details of experiment in pretty rudimentary terms, which I appreciate. However, there are still a few concepts we need to define according to Dunn before we attempt to wrap our thought noodles around all this. The first is the field of presentation. Dunn states, the field of presentation contains at any given instance of time, all the phenomena which happen to be offered for possible observation. For example, say you read a book. Your field of presentation contains the printed text of the pages that you are reading, but also contains, in that same instance, the little page number in the bottom right-hand corner. Although you may have failed to notice that, the numeral was was still clearly inside your field of presentation, just as a multitude of other things are as well. Maybe a bag of Cheetos on a coffee table, tattered dog toy on the floor, maybe an ink stain on a chair, They're presented to you and available for your attention, but go unnoticed. However, just because you are not paying attention to something does not mean you are unconscious of it. Your mind still registers its existence, but your focus lays elsewhere in the field of presentation. Although we have the ability to direct the focus of our attention, it is also possible for things external to us to direct it, like when our mind wanders or, you know, we're distracted by the environment around us. In real time, we process the visual information that has grabbed our attention, whatever it it may be, as what Dunn calls impressions. You can think of impressions as the image our mind's eye creates in direct response to the world around us. Impressions are directly associated with and caused by what is currently in front of us. They are unescapable and cannot be willed away. On the other hand, we also have what Dunn calls images. Images are the mental pictures that appear in our minds when the thing that they are based on is not in front of us. Dunn wrote, picture yourself in a room which you can remember. The process is not one of saying to yourself, let me see, there was a sofa in that corner and a piano in the other, and the color of the carpet was such and such. Rather, the whole of what you remember comes before your eyes in the form of a simultaneous vision. You deliberately manufacture and reconstruct an image from your memory bank. In short, the main difference between an impression and an image is that impressions are caused by the external information that's directly in front of you in this very moment, whereas images appear in our minds without the external information's presence. Impressions are when you picture the room that you're currently in. Images are when you try to picture a a different room from memory that you're not in. Uh, The other thing that differentiates uh, them greatly is what Dunn calls their reality tone, which uh, is sometimes called sensory vividness. He wrote, As compared with the room which you can see with your eyes, the room you are remembering seems unreal, yet real enough to be recognizable as a visual. The memory is recognizable as a memory. It has all the qualities of the original impression, but it lacks the appearance of reality. Try this right now. I, I, I found this very interesting. I did it uh, a couple times as I was researching. Look around whatever room you are in, like right now, or whatever non-room you know space you're in, such as the outdoors. Examine all the details, the texture of the paint, uh, bark of the tree, color of the dirt, etc. Right? I'm in the suck dungeon. I'm looking around. I see the little clock that lets me know how long the episode's been going. Uh, I see sound paneling. Right? I see uh, we're not using these, these drop-down tiles, office tiles above. Uh, those lights are off. We have our own kind of lighting kit. Never even noticed how many there were before. There's uh, five of them in front of me. There's all this uh, logo design, all this custom sound paneling that surrounds me with a little picture of Michael McDonald there. And 
uh, bumper sticker. And, you know, you get it. Little things on the table. Look at, you know, uh, James Brown and Woody and all kinds of stuff uh, around me. Now try to picture a room you're familiar with, but are not in. Because like the room around right now, it's like, of course, it's vivid. I'm seeing it right now. When I assemble these notes, I try to picture my bedroom, right? We have a bed that doesn't have a box spring. I'm trying to, you know, picture it right now. Uh, lays low on the floor. <laughs> Still sleeping on at least a mattress we got from a sponsor about five years ago now. Sheets and duvet cover. Uh, beige, I think. Um, I know I have a lamp on my bedside table. Uh, <laughs> I don't really use it. Uh, I know, okay, on Lindsay's bedside table, she has a lamp with, I think, a cylind- cylind- oh my gosh, cylinder, c- cylindrical. There we go. Little lampshade over it. Um, have two closet doors, white closet doors, pretty shallow closets. One closet is all Lindsay's. The other one is, uh, mostly Lindsay's <laughs> a little bit of mine. Um, there's a picture of Lindsay on one of the walls. There's fuck. There's a uh, one light above the bed. I can pretty much picture it. It's, I don't know. One bulb has kind of like a, uh, I can't even think of what it's called. Like a straw kind of design wicker. There we go. Wicker. <laughs> I had to write that down my notes. The bed frames may be dark cherry. Uh, the paint of the walls in my room, I literally cannot fucking picture what color the paint is. Uh, mentally exploring the room. Doing it now, and I did it more in depth before. I didn't want to just have a bunch of silence on the podcast. It does have a surreal quality to it. Like, I, I can explore it. I can move around in it, but it's all kind of fuzzy. It's all kind of dreamlike. So I understand what Dunn says here when he writes, you know, it, that it lacks the appearance of reality. It does seem very surreal. It's like everything's, yeah, a bit out of focus. Uh, Dunn also defines his concepts of what he calls a memory train and a train of ideas before we go forward. Memory train is pretty simple. A memory train is when you remember having sex with someone right before or right after someone else had sex with you and then another person has sex with you and then another, etc. If you remember at least five people having sex with you in a row, you had a train ran on you and now you're running a memory train on yourself. <laughs> a train of ideas is a little more complicated. It's when you're having sex, uh, having a sex train that ran on you. And the whole time it's happening, you and your sex partner are sharing a lot of different ideas with one another, right? Like someone might, for example, be like hitting you from behind while saying something like, hey, I, I was thinking about opening up a food truck that only serves like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And then you get to pick uh, different types of freshly baked bread, different kinds of peanut butter and different flavors of jams and jellies. And then you might respond right before you orgasm with like, oh, that's so cool. I just had an idea that someone should have been a commercial plane that's a fuck it. That's a bus too. It's also a bus and a boat as well. It's a plane, bus, boat thing. And that way, like when you land somewhere, you could just stay in your seat and they could drive you to your hotel. Or if you were staying on, on an island, they could drive you to the water's edge and then boat you to the island and drop you off. And God, that'd be so handy. What's cool about a train of ideas is that the ideas don't have to be good. Okay. Back, back to real definition. Now I'm an idiot. I'm going to try not to deviate too much anymore from what we're talking about. I know it's distracting. The train shit just really made me laugh when I was putting it together. Uh, now let's hear how J.W. Dunn actually defines the concepts of a memory train and a train of ideas. Try to recall a series of observed impressions. Uh, like, uh, you know, when you try to recall a succession of things that you witnessed in the order you witnessed them in, the images should appear in your mind in the order you saw them in real life. It requires a little effort, but should be, you know, fairly easily done according to Dunn. Uh, what did you just picture? Uh, when I did this for the first time, my memory train just out of nowhere, so random. I went straight to watching Michael Jordan dunk from the foul line in the 1988 slam dunk contest where he beat Dominic Wilkins, the human highlight show in Chicago. Right? I started with him. He's running back to the edge of the court and he runs all the way across the court, jumps from just a little bit past the foul line, fucking pumps that one hand, basketball back, legs splayed out to the side, slams at home, gets a perfect 50, crowd goes crazy uh, and wins, you know, in front of the hometown crowd. I had no idea I cared so much about that moment but I was able to picture it sequentially. On the other hand, when you allow your mind to wander and daydream without any specific goal of what you want to see or think about, the images that appear in a sequence have no real rhyme or meaning. That's called a train of ideas. It requires no effort. I feel like my brain is fucking flooded with so many idea trains zipping around all over the place and quite often running off of the tracks. I think that at some point or another, all of us have tried to retrace a train of ideas we got lost on back to its original starting point to maybe figure out what we were just about to say, for example, but now have forgotten. And often it's a very confusing and convoluted track to follow in reverse. I do this at least once a day. You know, we just have that moment of like, shit. God, I just forgot what, what we were t- I was going to say. What were we talking about, Lindsay? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, taking my grandma to New Orleans. Uh, no, that's before that. 
Uh, Monroe's last basketball game uh, of the season. Uh, no, something about before that. Uh, how Ginger Bell freaked out when Monroe and I ran in, around the house. Uh, me wearing a Santa Claus costume, ringing a little bell, belting out, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. And then her following me in the Grinch suit. And then Ginger would flee in terror. Ah, I'm not. Oh, I remember now. I wanted to know if you picked up any more coconut flavored yogurt at the store. I just ate the last one. I was hoping to have more for breakfast. That example is not random, by the way. Uh, Monroe and I did that last night, last night as I record this. Our ideas and thoughts connect together, not in a neat chain link line, but are muddled and tied in knots. And oftentimes we are the only people that can really understand why one image in our mind sparks another seemingly completely unrelated one. Okay. Only one more definition we need to go over now before we get into the dream experiment. Probably the most important. How does Dunn define dreams? He writes, Dreams, like many other mental phenomena, are composed largely of images supplied by an association, associational network, i.e. the linking together of a series of random thoughts that your mind for some reason associates together. But they differ from mind wandering in several important respects. In a theater form of activity, mind wandering, reason is nearly always partially at work to determine the course to be followed along the network. But in dreams, this guidance seems to be largely lacking. And the dream images present themselves as real, though curiously unstable, episodes in a personal adventure story of an only partially reasonable character. <laughs> I love the last line of a uh, personal adventure story of an only partially reasonable character. Yeah, I am uh, partially reasonable uh, at best in my dreams. I can almost never remember my dreams because I don't write them down. I'll have one to share later that I did write down uh, because of this episode. But they tend to be so fucking weird. Like I'll be in a canoe. With my best friend from fifth grade, who I haven't thought about in years, except we're both adults now. And he's mad at me because I didn't pay for a chili dog or something. And then the dream will cut to me. I'm teaching a college class. And one of the students is flirting with me. And I'm worried that my wife's going to find out. And my wife looks a lot like Jennifer Aniston. But maybe now we're not married anymore suddenly. And I'm sad. And I'm alone. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to sell all these cows because I'm about to lose the farm. And then it jumps to me being so fucking happy that everybody loved my spaghetti. And by everyone, I mean the tennis team that I'm a coach of. And for some reason, my former mother-in-law is my assistant coach. And I'm fucking pissed that she keeps giving the players the exact opposite advice I give. Them. Who's a fucking coach, Bobby? You or me? You know, like, just, there's just so much like, why the hell was I dreaming that? Now let's look into why Dunn even cared about dreams. Prior to setting out on his experiment, Dunn was inspired by a series of dreams that seemed to be prophetic to him occurring over the course of many years. In January of 1901, Dunn was the, in the Italian R Riviera. Uh, he just got sent back home. Uh, he was sick from the Boer War for that first time. And he wrote, I dreamed one night that I was at a place which I took to be Kashoda, a little way up the Nile from Khartoum. The dream was a perfectly ordinary one and by no means vivid except in one particular. This was the sudden appearance of three men coming from the south. They were marvelously ragged, dressed in khaki, faded to the color of sackcloth. Their faces under the dusty sun helmets were burned almost black. They looked, in fact, exactly like soldiers of the column with which with which I had lately been trekking in South Africa and such I took them to be. I was puzzled as to why they should have traveled all the way from the, that country to Sudan and I questioned them on that point. They assured me, however, this was precisely what they had done. We've come right through the Cape, said one, added another. I've had an awful time. I nearly died of yellow fever. Okay, cut to the morning. He opens today's issue of the Daily Telegraph from England and the headline reads, The Cape to Cairo, Expedition at Khartoum. From our special correspondent in Khartoum, Thursday, 5 p.m. The story proceeds to detail the journey of three men, one of which had not died of yellow fever, but of enteric. Uh, Dunn also notes that he had no prior knowledge of the transcontinental journey. If one does not chalk all this up to coincidence, their next guess might be astral wandering, a.k.a. astral projection, which at the time and now was believed by a lot of spiritualists to be the phenomena of the soul detaching itself from the body and traveling to another place on Earth. Far from a proven phenomena, I know. We're in weird territory here. However, as the journey had concluded the previous day, prior to Dunn having the dream, that could not be the case. Dunn made no conclusion of his bizarre experience and attempted no explanation at the time. The next dream he had that caught his attention was, as he described it, as dramatic as any lower, as dramatic as any lover of the marvelous could desire. In the spring of 1902, Dunn was back in the military. With the 6th Mounted Military uh, encamped in South Africa, one night he had an exceptionally vivid dream where he was standing on high ground and from the uh, earth around him, there seemed to be little fissures with jets of vapor spurting out from them. In the dream, he recognized the place as an island he had heard about before, but had never visited, which stood in the shadow of an active volcano. And he soon put it together that the whole thing was about to blow up. 
For some reason, he was seized with an intense goal of saving 4,000 unsuspecting people. 4,000. That number practically branded into his mind. Has that ever happened to you? Where for some reason in your dream, uh, there's some fact or another that you feel is just indisputable. Very important. Uh, Dunn wrote, all throughout the dream, the number of people in danger obsessed in my mind. I repeated it to everyone I met. And at the moment of my waking, I was shouting, listen, 4,000 people will be killed unless. That morning, the Daily Telegraph read, volcano disaster in Martinique. Town swept away in avalanche of flame. Dunn read the paper, uh, Dunn read the paper hastily, learning that approximately 4,000 people had died. However, when he returned to the paper later, he realized that he had misread it. The number was actually 40,000. So what did all that mean to Dunn? He felt that the idea of astral projection was again out of the question because the dream did not take place during the time of the actual disaster. He wasn't actually out of his body somehow watching the disaster unfold in real time. Dunn also concluded that it could not be clairvoyance because an important and uh, inherent fact of the event was incorrect. The number he thought about in his dream was 36,000 off of the actual number. Furthermore, the island in his dream did not look like the real life island. Of course, there was no way for sure for him to know that because he couldn't look it up on Google. But he knew the geography of the island in his dream was probably not configured how the real island's geography looked on maps. So if not clairvoyance or astral projection, what was it? If he had, ha, if he had, had the dream the following night after he misread the newspaper article as saying 4,000 instead of 40, then the dream would have made sense. But he didn't dream it after he misread the newspaper article. He dreamt it before. And that led down to this, uh, his hypothesis. In both the dream about the three men in Africa and the dream about the volcano, quote, The dream had been precisely the sort of thing I might have expected to be experienced after reading the printed report, a perfectly ordinary dream based upon the personal experience of reading. But he, of course, had not had the personal experience of reading yet, and he was puzzled. Dunn chronicled 22 more dreams he had of that same nature, which we won't go over here because, as he puts it himself, they were fucking boring. He said incredibly mundane. Uh, Dreams about normal, almost boring things, uh, only remarkable because they were happening before the event that should have inspired them. He was now of the mind that these dreams were not impressions of distant future events. They were the usual commonplace dreams composed of distorted images of waking experience built together in the usual half senseless fashion peculiar to dreams. That is to say, if they had happened on the nights after the corresponding events, they would have exhibited nothing in the smallest degree unusual and would have yielded just as much true and just as much false information regarding the waking experiences which had given rise to them, as does any ordinary dream, uh, which, you know, of which there is very little. And to go Twilight Zone again, they were the ordinary, appropriate, expectable dreams. But they were occurring on the wrong nights. No, there was nothing unusual in any of these dreams as dreams. They were merely displaced in time. I had clearly entered the fourth dimension. Other than that last line about the fourth dimension, that was all done. Uh, He believed he really did have the dreams on the wrong night, that he was somehow displaced in time while he was asleep. Uh, At first, Dunn thought the phenomena of having dreams that occur the wrong night was a rare experience that few others experienced as well. And that displeased him. And he wrote, I was suffering seemingly from some extraordinary fault in my relation to reality. Something so uniquely wrong, it compelled me to perceive at rare intervals. Large blocks of otherwise perfectly normal personal experience displaced from their proper positions in time. That such things could occur at all was a most interesting piece of knowledge. But unfortunately, in the circumstance, it could be knowledge to only one person myself. There was, however, a very remote possibility that by employing this piece of curiously acquired knowledge as a guide, I might be able to discover some uh, hitherto overlooked peculiarity in the structure of time. And to that task, I applied myself. Dunn now began conducting a dream experiment. Pretty simple experiment. Though he conducted it for multiple years, it's easily uh, replicable in a single week. And it goes like this. Dunn woke up every morning and before he did anything else, he wrote down his dreams in a journal he kept by his bedside. He then went about his normal day and routine. Before going to sleep that night, he reviewed the notes from his dreams the night before and looked for any similarities between them and his waking experience that day. We will later go over what he constituted as a similarity. For the sake of the experiment, he limited the time frame that a dream and a waking event could occur within... uh, Uh, could occur within each other to two days. So a dream he had on Monday night can only be compared to the events of Tuesday uh, or Wednesday. This is because over the course of a lifetime, hundreds of events could end up to seemingly match some random event in your dreams just because you're looking at so many events. 
He decided that only if the similarity between the waking event and previously had dream was outrageous and incredible and too big to ignore any similarities found past two days since the dream took place were null and void from the experiment. At the very early stages of his experiment, he began talking with some friends about it and found that many of them had similar experiences. This led him to the supposition that having a dream about something before that something has actually occurred is not a rare thing, but an experience had by many. This opened up a floodgate of new questions for Dunn. What about the curious feeling which almost everyone has now and then experience? That sudden, fleeting, disturbing conviction that something which is happening at that moment has happened before. What about those occasions when, receiving an unexpected letter from a friend who writes rarely, one recollects having dreamed of him during the previous night? What about all those dreams which, after having been completely forgotten, are suddenly, for no apparent reason, recalled later in the day? What is the association which recalls them? What about those puzzling dreams from which one is awakened by a noise or other sensory event, dreams in which the noise in question appears as the final dream incident? Which is that this closing incident, or why is that this closing incident is always logically led up to by the earlier parts of the dream? What, finally, of all these cases, where a dream of a friend's death has been followed by the receipt next day of the confirmatory news, these dreams were clearly not messages from the dead, but instances of what I had experienced Simple dreams associated merely with the coming personal experience of reading the news. Uh, I, do think, I do kind of think it's funny how Dunn immediately rules out messages from the dead and concludes that uh, you know these dreams are further proof of displaced time. I mean, he makes his argument, uh, but still, it's uh, funny to me to um, you know just dismiss one pretty at face value outlandish thing, but then you know be confident in another. It feels a little bit like uh, saying something like, uh, "Yeah, you could have seen a skinwalker. That's not real. You had to have seen a Sasquatch." Anyway, continuing now with Dunn's experiment. Only just getting started on his experiment and now burdened with the knowledge that so many others have experienced the same thing as he, Dunn wrote that, I had done nothing but suppose in hopelessly unscientific fashion for a week or more, and it seemed to me that I might as well complete my sinning. So I took a final wild leap into the wildest supposition of all. Was it possible that these phenomena were not abnormal, but normal? Is it possible that dreams, dreams in general, all dreams, everybody's dreams, were composed of images of past experiences and images of future experiences blended together in approximately equal proportions. Is it possible that the universe was, after all, stretched out in time and that the lopsided view we had of it, a view of the future, part unaccountably missing, cut off from the growing past by a traveling present moment, was due to a purely mentally imposed barrier which existed only when we are awake? Fucking weird... After a year of experimenting with his dreams, displaced in time theory, in solitary, Dunn decided to open up the experiment up to a test group. He had concluded at this point that precognitive dreams are merely a normal characteristic of man's general relationship to time, but one so constituted as to elude casual observation. Therefore, that meant that precognition should be just as experimentally observable to everyone else as it was to myself. Dunn went on to choose his test subjects carefully. Weary of the incredulousness of spiritualists and their predilection for attributing phenomena to the extraordinary, he chose only those whom he called, quote, extremely normal, persons that had never before experienced anything, quote, psychic. <laughs> I wonder what he said privately about who not to pick when talking with his friends. Lady Julia Edwards? Oh, absolutely not, Roger. A lot of people are going to have a hard time taking my displaced dream seriously at face value. It is imperative that I do not pick people like Lady Julia who claims that she has a book of spells that allow her to speak with ravens and that she once uh, bought, brought her childhood dog Dimples back to life on the night of this past summer solstice by allowing its soul to possess the body of her current Pekingese, Mr. Cheeky. It's the same goddamn dog, Roger. It's still Mr. Cheeky, who now appears thoroughly bewildered at Lady Julia suddenly changed his name six years into his life. Anyway, Dunn also sought out test subjects who claimed that they never dreamt. He felt that these people would offer the most striking results should they attain them. Here are the directions he gave to his test group, and if you would like, you can conclude or conduct, excuse me, the experiment yourself and decide if he's right. Before anything else, you need to choose when you're going to conduct the experiment. He suggests that the time that someone new to the process will get the most fruitful, fruitful results is when they have a busy and abnormal schedule. He felt this is because instances of precognition are most easily identifiable in the waking experience. According to Dunn, when your life is dull and monotonous, Harder to pinpoint precognition because what happens in your life after the dream takes place is so similar to what happened before. Quote, since the possibility of satisfactory identification of precognitive dreams would depend mainly upon unusualness in the incident, 
the worst time to choose for the experiment would be the period when one was leading the dull life, with each day exactly like the last. It would be best to select nights preceding a journey of some other expected or some other expected break in the monotony of circumstance. Uh, how funny and sad that, it, that you're not a good candidate for pulling off this experiment if your life is just boring. Uh, once you've chosen a time period, let's say right before you move to a new state or when you're about to start a new job, the next obstacle you have to overcome is remembering your dreams and filling in the gaps from the night before. And it seems like an almost impossible task. I know for me, even if I've had the most wild and fucked up and fantastical dream, the specifics of it oftentimes seem to dissipate before I've even had breakfast. By the time noon rolls around, details of my dream almost completely disappear. Although it can be tempting, Dunn says that one thing that will absolutely hinder your chances of remembering your dream is concentrating directly on it upon waking. Has that ever happened to you? You wake up, the more you focus on the dream you had the night before, the more it just seems to vanish right? Like it drives me crazy to have that feeling that I dreamt something really intense and vivid. And then like sand, it just slips through my fingers. You know, the harder I try to squeeze and hold on to it, the faster it just leaves me. Dunn Dun suggests that instead of focusing on the actual dream you were just having, try to remember what you were thinking when you woke up. He felt this will help you retrace your steps in order to find yourself back in the dreamscape. Next part of the experiment takes a little getting used to. Before you do anything else, as soon as your eyes open, you need to get into the habit of grabbing your notebook, taking your pen, writing down your dreams. If you wait even a minute, Dunn says you could jeopardize the data. Report as much detail as you concisely, uh, report as much detail as you can, as concisely as you can. He says long-winded and vague descriptions are actually not helpful. And that's because at the end of the day, you want to be able to compare the facts of the dream to the facts of the day. And the easiest way to do that is, you know, with uh, robust but succinct reports. That is also why you need to distinguish between the components of your dream apart from your analysis of it. As Dunn puts it, the dreaming mind is a master hand attacking false interpretations onto everything it perceives. For this reason, the record of the dream should describe as separate facts A, the actual appearance of what is seen, and B, the interpretation given to the appearance. Another reason for writing details, uh, detailed reports on your dreams is because searching for instances of precognition is going to be sort of like mining for gold. Just like an average dream is not based solely on the day that preceded it, a precognitive dream not based solely on the future. Dunn says that a precognitive dream will contain both elements of past and future events intermingled and mixed together. Therefore, the more details you include about your dream, the easier it will be to identify between the two. According to his theory, that precognitive dreams are a part of our ordinary human faculties, which he dubbed the normality hypothesis, if precognitive dreams are a universal experience, then that also means that they have to occur on a fairly regular basis. However, it doesn't seem like they do. Many people would say that if they've had a precognitive dream, they've never noticed it. And for those who have noticed it, only happens once or twice a year. But if Dunn's right, they happen constantly, and we just don't notice it. And how could that be true? How is it possible that there's an aspect to our human experience that's always been there, but has eluded us for so long? How is it possible that something like that could go unnoticed? Dunn says, this is because the mind, upon finding a correlation between a previous dream and something that happened after the dream took place, refuses to acknowledge that experience. Quote, the waking mind refuses point blank to accept the association between the dream and the subsequent event. For it, the association is the wrong way around. And no sooner does the correlation make itself perceived than it is instantly rejected. The intellectual revolt is automatic and extremely powerful. Even when confronted with the indisputable evidence of the written record, one jumps at any excuse to avoid recognition. He goes on to say that the most common excuse people use to disregard the correlation is by saying that the dream about the future event was not similar enough to the actual future event. For example, if someone has a dream about dropping a gallon of milk on the kitchen floor, spilling it everywhere, the next day they witness someone in line at the grocery store, drop a gallon of milk, spill it everywhere, their immediate conclusion might be that it couldn't be a precognitive dream because they dreamt about their kitchen when the event took place, not the grocery store. However, Dunn says that would not disqualify the dream from being considered precognitive. This is because, as he so often repeats, the faculty which dreams of the future is the same as the faculty which dreams of the past. We cannot expect the resemblances to the future to be any more striking than the resemblances to the past. In other words, because precognitive dreams are just the same as normal dreams, just happened on the wrong night, they're equally as inaccurate in their portrayal of the event which inspires them. The only thing that makes them different is that we haven't experienced the event yet. Knowing the precognitive dreams are just as convoluted as regular ass dreams, it makes meticulous note-taking that much more important. Here's an example of the type of note-taking Dunn's talking about. Let's say you dream about a leather-bound red book with some coins resting on top of it. 
The rest of the dream, a little fuzzy, but it looks like you're inside the control room of a submerged submarine, even though you can't really see the whole of the submarine's interior. In the morning, you guess that you dreamt about a submarine because your mother-in-law makes you feel like you're fucking suffocating, especially when she won't let you coach your tennis team. It's your team and you earned it. She's the assistant. She's remembered her place, uh, but for real. In the morning, uh, you guess that you dreamt about a submarine because your mother-in-law makes you feel like uh, you're suffocating whenever she's around and she's coming to visit soon. In the dream, there was also someone else in there with you and they had a big mustache and a bald head. They were talking about chili dogs. Uh, are they better combined? Are they better to be eaten separately? You know, the chili and the dog. When you wake up, you take note of what you saw immediately. The color, the material of the book's binding, the amount of change on top of it, which, uh, which coins they were, the fact that you were in a submarine, the man in there with you, uh, his appearance, what he was saying about chili and hot dogs. As a separate note, you uh, could include your analysis about your mother-in-law, but it's really not important to this experiment. What is important is concise details, like the amount of change on the book. This is because coins resting on a book could be a fairly common sight in the world. But if you dreamt about exactly three dimes and one quarter on a red leather bound book, and the very next day you saw three dimes and one quarter on a red leather bound book, that is substantial enough correlation to be considered data. Once you've recorded your dream, you can set about your day. When you come home before you get too tired, review your notes from last night's dreams, look for any correlations between what you dreamt about and what you experienced upon waking. The easiest way to do this is to pretend that you are reading a summary of the dreams you are going to have that night. And if possible, identify any experiences you had while awake that would cause them. Although Dunn suggests we keep an open mind when reviewing our dream reports, he also says we can't just accept anything as precognition. It has to meet a fair amount of criteria first. Dunn writes that we have to recognize that there are no limits to the possibilities of coincidence. Consequently, evidence of precognition is of a purely statistical character, a matter of balancing probabilities. We are not dealing with an exact science, but with a method which approximates steadily towards exact science as the probabilities grow higher. I truly love how serious he took this shit, right? He took building planes seriously. He took fly fishing real seriously. Now he's taking trying to figure out if our fucking dreams get lost in the fourth dimension seriously. Dunn tells the reader that you have to be careful and fairly unyielding. The correlation between the dream you had and the waking incident has to be obvious and explicit. Dunn says there's no wiggle room. Indirect correlations or vague similarities are not valid data. Despite this, Dunn asserts, you will still find a substantial amount of valid data, that is a substantial number of instances, where you dreamt of something prior to that something coming to be. From both himself and his test subjects, Dunn collected enough positive data to reach his conclusion and form his final theory as we get to wrap up here. Uh, I almost forgot that I need, <laughs> need, of course, some fresh Twilight Zone music. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of displaced dreams. You think seeing children being cut in half by Pat Sajak wearing samurai armor is utter nonsense. But then the next day you solve two puzzles on Wheel of Fortune by correctly guessing chopped up kids to solve puzzle one and samurai sword to solve puzzle two. You have just returned from the fourth dimension. Uh, Dunn's conclusion has three parts that he writes successfully about in the latter half of an experiment with time. Uh, here's a heavily summarized rundown. First, Dunn concluded that the phenomenon of precognitive dreams is not a phenomenon at all. In fact, it's a universal human experience. Precognitive dreams are an integral part of our normative faculties and relationship with time. However, we simply are less likely to recognize them given our preconceived notions of how time should function. Dunn believed that precognition is not at all the superhuman characteristic and other explanations for seemingly prophetic dreams like clairvoyance, receiving messages from the dead, astral projection, and premonition, seeing the future, are therefore unfounded and invalid. Secondly, Dunn came to the conclusion that precognitive dreams occur because while we are asleep, the barriers that prevent us from experiencing time as it truly is are broken down and we are now able to access the fourth dimension. Uh, this mirrors Hinton's theory that our three-dimensional existence limits us from being about to perceive or from being able to perceive the fourth dimension. Thirdly, Dunn concluded that if the conscious mind can only experience time linearly, linearly, but the unconscious mind can observe time from a higher dimension, uh, that must also mean that there is another dimension even higher than that, where another unconscious mind or observer can watch the lower two and so on and so on into infinity. One way to think about this is imagine a person that paints himself, painting into his picture, then paints another one of himself, painting himself into the picture, then another one painting himself, painting himself, painting himself, and so on forever and ever. 
That person that's doing the painting is the ultimate observer and all the renditions of himself. You can think of them as his soul existing in each additional dimension. He called that theory serial time and it is a fucking headache. <laughs> oh boy, to understand. So I'm not going to try and explain it because I can't. Makes me want to claw my eyes out. What is real? What does anything even mean? What is time? What is life? What are souls? What are dimensions? Is David Icke right? Am I lost in the fifth dimension with Julianne fucking Dotton 663? And how can we find the fourth dimension so we can find the Gothic window portal on the floor of the Baltic Sea near the center of the Gulf of Bothnia? Why is it so much more challenging to push big objects into our buttholes than it is to push large objects out of our buttholes? Seriously, though. Uh, Thinking about all that we went over today is fascinating and also brain melting. And I feel like I could go mad if I thought about uh, too much of this for too long. Uh, when it was published, an experiment with time became an instant sensation, both in popular culture and scientific circles. Dunn had effectively refurbished the way that many people think about time. And the trajectory of fourth dimensional philosophy was altered forever. Even if he did not answer the question, what is time? He at least gave us a new possibility of how we think about time and also dreams. Nothing else. You know, it's something captivating to think about. And it makes for interesting conversation. So now some final thoughts. What if, and I know it's a big if, this shit is true. What if A, there is a fourth dimension like so many people, so much better at math than I am, believe. And what if B, we have a fourth dimensional aspect to our being, right? Our soul. What if there is some magic inside of us connected to a higher type of consciousness and existence that we can't access, at least in our waking hours, because the limitations, uh, you know, that we, uh, these meat sack mortal coils put upon us. And what if C, That many supposed paranormal encounters with seemingly non-human entities, entities that sometimes blip in and out of existence, entities that don't appear fully formed, translucent, or shadowy, maybe they appear off and unsettling because, just like the 2D triangle can only interpret the 3D cube as a 2D square because of the physical limitations of its perspective, we are not seeing these 4D entities properly, and our limited minds are struggling with how to interpret a 4D being in a 3D world. Finally, what if D, sometimes in our dream state, we somehow and this is one of the biggest stretches for me, become displaced in time thanks to time itself being considered the fourth dimension by some and not being linear. Maybe not a flat circle, but not a straight line either, always moving forward. All of this would mean, I think, that there is some next level of existence, a 4D plane possibly superimposed over our 3D lives and entities functioning in this fourth dimension can not only move forwards and backwards, sideways, up and down in a physical sense, they can also move in any direction within time itself. I think. I think. That is at least part of what all this means. I had to really push my brain on this one this week to try and understand it. Uh, And I don't understand all of it, but neither does anyone else. Because just like someone who is blind and always has been blind will never truly know what it is like to see, no matter how thoroughly they might understand it in some academic theoretical sense, we will truly never understand the fourth dimension, at least not in this life, because thanks to uh, our three-dimensional trappings, we literally can't fully truly understand what a fourth-dimensional existence would look or feel like. Unless, of course, we're, you know, Julianne Dotton 663. Like a 3D cube could easily understand the totality of the comparatively limited 2D triangle's existence. Uh, Julianne's 5D ass can easily understand what the fuck is going on here in the the third dimension and also in the fourth dimension. It's a bummer she didn't tell us. Why waste time listening to David Icke if you're already beyond his teachings? Come on, Julie. I would think living in the fifth dimension would leave you with more confidence. I think it would mean that you should teach us, right? And probably rule us or at least save us from the reptilian motherfuckers Dave is always babbling on about. What do I know? I'm just some lame-ass third-dimensional meat sack who can't remember ever uh, having any precognitive dreams. But I did remember because of being into this shit last few days, a dream I had this morning. At least part of it. And I almost never remember dreams. Weird coincidence. I wrote it down, you know, because this subject was on my mind. Uh, In the dream I just had last night. (laughs) This is not my bullshit. Lindsay and I were driving down some highway or freeway, some paved road. No other cars around that I noticed. It was light out, just the two of us. Then we had to slow down and stop as we approached an overpass because there wasn't enough room between the road and the overpass for our car to drive beneath the overpass. Couldn't get through. That freaked me out. It's not normal. Lindsay, though, totally calm about it. Like it was normal for one road to be built over another and they didn't leave enough room uh, for cars on the bottom road to pass through. So we get out of the car now. Start walking towards the overpass on foot, trying to get to wherever we're going. As we approach the overpass, it, it, it was suddenly, uh, you know, not even close to the bottom road. Like not only could you not drive, you know, underneath it, you could not walk underneath it, standing straight. You couldn't even crouch down and scurry underneath it. You had to get down on your hands and knees and crawl now. And now it's getting dark. I am nervous. Lindsay's calm. 
Now she's encouraging me to crawl through, you know, this uh, opening, crawl underneath this overpass, and I don't want to. And for some reason, she is not crawling with me. Like, why do I have to do it? Well, she talks me into doing it, and now I'm crawling. And the space just keeps getting tighter. I'm just army crawling, just on my belly. And I tell her, like, I don't, I don't think I can make it through to the other side. And she just keeps saying, she's like, no, you're fine. Just keep going. Just a lot of like, keep going. And she's saying this from the other side. She's still not trying to crawl through herself. And then finally, I cannot crawl any further. It just keeps getting tighter. And now I'm stuck and I can't back up. I can't get out of this space. It keeps shrinking. Now I can't see any light on the other side either. I'm just trapped in there in the darkness. I'm panicking. And I hear Lindsay behind me telling me everything's fine. Just keep going. Everything is not fucking fine. And then I woke up. Or at least I don't remember any more of the dream. So if I get crushed by a highway or freeway overpass anytime soon, the day of this recording, ideally, <laughs> or not really ideally, but for you, or the next day, or Lindsay talks me into doing something that gets me killed or straight up just kills me, please first be a little sad for me. Okay, just a little at least. But also second, please be so happy that my sacrifice just proved that all this crazy fourth dimension time shit is probably real. Time for our takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, mathematician C.H. Hinton was the first person to popularize the concept of the fourth dimension. By using rational thinking and the laws of physics, he outlined how it was possible that a dimension higher than our own exists and theorized why we can't always see it. Number two, Hinton theorized that we are actually four-dimensional beings confined in three-dimensional bodies, and many have interpreted this to mean that we all have souls that will live on after our bodies have died. Because of this, his theory has also been seen as an explanation for the existence of spirits, so much so that when it was published, his book, What is the Fourth Dimension, was nicknamed Ghosts Explained. Uh, Number three, inspired by Hinton in the early 20th century, aeronautical engineer and pilot J.W. Dunn endeavored to construct his own theories about time. Throughout his life, he'd experienced what is commonly known as a type of deja vu, the phenomenon of experiencing something and realizing that you experienced or dreamt, you know, uh, of that exact moment before. Dunn wanted to find a sensible reason behind these seemingly prophetic dreams that wasn't clairvoyance or paranormal activity. So he conducted an experiment with his dreams to see how often they seemed to be predicting the future. He published the results in his widely successful experiment with time. Number four, Dunn came to the conclusion that the dreams he had weren't prophetic at all. In fact, they were perfectly normal dreams about perfectly normal things. Only they were occurring on the wrong night. This led him to believe that it wasn't that he was seeing the future, but that building off of Hinton's philosophy, as humans, we have a fourth dimensional existence, but are limited by our three dimensional bodies and minds. Only when we are asleep are those limitations broken down and we're able to experience the fourth dimension time as it truly is non-linear. Fucking wild ass thought. Number five, new info. Both C.H. Henson and J.W. Dunn each inspired thousands of storytellers with their theories on time, but the most significant was probably author H.G. Wells. Although he was personal friends with Dunn, as uh, I briefly mentioned earlier, it was after he read Hinton's work on the fourth dimension that Wells was inspired to write his first novel, The Time Machine, published in 18, 1895. Wells' debut still considered uh, one of the most important works of literature today, And in it, Wells explores what it would mean to move forward in time. In the book, Wells also invents two new phrases into the English language, time machine and time traveler. So much time today. If you didn't absorb it all, just head on over to Scandinavia, access the fourth dimension, re-listen a few times and pop back into this present moment. Easy peasy. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Whew. Fourth dimension. Sucked as best as I can suck it. <laughs> that didn't make. If anything didn't make sense to you, I'm just gonna blame it on you being a three-dimensional being, and it's impossible to understand. Right? Wasn't anything I fucked up. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for uh, helping making time suck, such as Queen of Bad Magic Lindsay Cummins running operations around here, so I can focus on this shit. Art Warlock Logan Keith recording the episode, designing the merch. Molly Jean Box killing it with the initial research this week and pitching this topic. She sold me on it. I hope I was able to sell some of you on it. Uh, thanks to all the all seen eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Smart Sucker and Definite Pervert, Eric Lee. Finally. 
Truly, it's taught me why I should appreciate defense attorneys who represent heinous dirtbags like Carl Watts uh, that we just covered a few weeks ago. Eric writes, first off, yummo time suck. Uh, Dan, you triple M sucking mofo. I'm a longtime listener, space lizard, and Patreon patronizer. Thank you. I love the short sucks. Well, thank you again. Uh, during more than one suck, I've heard you question why a defense attorney would take certain cases. The simple answer is everyone is entitled to a defense by the Constitution and someone has to do it. As far as why they so zealously defend their client, I remember reading an article about a prosecutor's thoughts on this subject a long while back. I wish I could remember the article that explains why it is a good thing that defense attorneys go all out on some of the most insane, horrible cases. I think it may have been a Playboy 20 questions interview around the time of the OJ trial. See, I did buy it for the articles. <laughs> he writes, ha but <laughs> I cannot find the article, so I cannot verify. It essentially boiled down to when a defense attorney does any and everything they can during a trial to try to get their client found not guilty, and then the client is convicted, it makes appeals that much harder to win, thus making sure the perpetrators do their full sentence. So honestly, the worse a criminal is, we meet sacks are better off in the long run when their lawyer is good at their job. Just my two cents. I'm not a lawyer, just a sucker with a thought. Three out of five stars, just like our national parks wouldn't change a thing, Eric Lee. Uh, Eric, holy shit, man. No one's ever explained to me why defense attorneys should do a good job representing heinous dirtbags. Uh, and I'm sure not all of them do that, you know, for this reason. But I will try and remember this, uh, you know, like no matter why they do it, that there is a great reason for them to do their best, right? To make sure that once they're convicted, they stay convicted. That's brilliant. Also, Eric, I hope you had a lot of fun digging through old Playboys, trying to find that article. I, I bet you never got distracted once. Hail to Safina. I uh, hope you didn't break your boner. And now it's bent at a 90 degree angle like mine used to be either. Uh, next up, moron meat sack. <laughs> Emily Baxter just fucked herself at work and is trying to blame it on me. Emily's not a moron. Uh, she seems awesome. And she writes in all caps to start, Dan, you goddamn fucking cum. <laughs> Dan, you goddamn fucking cum gutter to Bojangles mighty dick. May Lucifina royally fuck you while Bojangles fucks your poop hole loophole until you get peanut butter, butter all over his chest while he sings to you. Well, you know, it's the best when the poop hits your chest. That's how I come. Hello, master sucker. I'm sorry for my previous bit of anger, but goddamn it, you finally got me. Let's just say that I finally was the victim of Cummins Law. Just started a new job and I finally had one that I liked and could listen to my podcast while I work again. Last year was horrible for me financially and emotionally, but I'm still here sucking because, hey, there's no time suck if I die, not worth a risk. I like the attitude. It's my first day and I hadn't used my earbuds on my new phone yet because I couldn't use it during work till now. Well, I went to play Pandora and it was the dolphin experiment episode. All was well for a while until I went to double tap on the earbud to get it to play again. I took my earbud out when it didn't work to readjust it. And my phone starts playing out loud as you were describing a sexually pleasure a dolphin. <laughs> then out of sheer panic, because I had no idea what your mush mouth was going to say next. To make it worse, I started screaming, no, 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 I'm so sorry. Uh, as I go to close the app, it's still playing with the app closed. My brain not knowing what else to do at this time, thinking this can't be happening to me. I've been so careful. Decides to run away with my phone and my jacket as I panic. Then I turn the volume down as I freak out about what to do because it won't stop playing. Eventually, I'm able to force stop the app and get the earbuds working properly again. But I look around and see my new bosses standing there, not sure whether to laugh or be mad. Been almost three weeks now and uh, no one has mentioned what happened. They also gave me a dollar raise starting next week, so I guess all is fine. But man, that could have been bad. At least you weren't screaming, fuck your family. You finally got me, you son of a bitch, but I still love you. I hope the Bojangles is, uh, keeps being a good boy. Uh, doesn't fuck you. <laughs> And that Lucifina blesses you. Thank you so much for this podcast. It has helped me more than you'll ever know. You're the best. And keep up the good work, my dude. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. Blessed be. Emily Baxter, body slave to Lucifina, cult of the curious member, and forever time sucker. Oh, Emily, congratulations on your new job, your new raise. And I am truly glad that I didn't get you fired. Had a pleasure, Dolphin. I've talked about a lot of weird shit here over the years. That's got to be the top 10, right? Weirdest things I've talked about. I know I've probably said more horrific things, but that's just so strange. Uh, keep keeping Lucifina happy. I'm so glad you're still here. And I hope this year is so much better than last year was for you. Uh, Nimrod, make it so. Next up, Cubano, sucking super sack Frankie Perez. Share some insight on the Castro episode from a while back. He writes, hi, Dan, the man with the master plan, cooking sandwiches on a pan. The AC went out, so you got to use a fan. That was all him. Frankie, uh, then Frankie writes, now that I've surprised you with my really shitty rhyming skills as my introduction, I'd like to say thank you very much for the years that I've been hearing this podcast in my time while I'm at work. 
For starters, my name is Frankie from Miami, Florida. And as a week ago, I got back into uh, my diesel mechanic field. Not saying which company, but I'll tell you this. I really thought that they were Italians, which surprised me that they were from the Netherlands. I don't know which one that is. Uh, that being said, I like hearing your podcast while I'm at work. Your storytelling along with your absurd humor makes me smile. The episode with Chris Hansen is what got me intrigued with your show. Comedy kept me there. Now for my actual reason, I'm here. I got done hearing the Castro suck. And as a son of two Cuban immigrants who have very harsh criticisms of socialism, I can say that you've done a wonderful job telling the truth of how we got into power and what really happened when he, or what, you know, he got into power and what really happened when he did. And man, I can sense all the socialists quivering. I grew up hearing stories of what it was like to be in Cuba. And every day, I thank God that even though our country has some fuck ups, at least I'm not with egg rations and need to go to a black market for something as simple as aspirin. As a libertarian with right leanings in certain parts, I'm very against government control. And I also know that you don't want to trust your politicians too easily because, as my country has seen, we swapped one dictator for someone much worse. I understand it was corruption before Castro, but I also didn't have as many family members building rafts, rafts out of tin shells and bags just to get to the States. Many of us that are descendants of people that grew up in the Castro regime from the conception also hold the belief that a tyrannical socialist government, and yeah, he had communists, I know, uh, pretty, pretty much communism as well. Yeah, it's communist. Uh, we do not take that government lightly and we're in the streets parading because we got news that he finally died. To wish death on somebody is not a, it's not appropriate, but we make killer jokes on how we can go back in time and give his dad a condom. So let's be more honest about it. Oh yeah, no, there's plenty of fucking people I wish were dead. Uh, but I digress. I've been very critical of gun control as well because I, as, as much as I can understand somebody having the belief the society would be better off without guns, uh, we're going to have to be a little more realistic. Many tyrannical governments started off with some sort of gun control and now we have countries whose people don't have access to firearms and also don't have access to proper nutrition to prevent a revolution that would get some shit done. In 2021, there was an attempt from the people wanting freedom uh, and to not stay indoors and it it made its way to Miami, Florida, so much so that there was a rumored group of paramilitary men and women willing to go to Cuba to fight for their people on the grounds they have immunity from the U.S. government. That'd be fucking fascinating if a bunch of people, like citizens, just formed a militia, went to Cuba and just overthrew it. Uh, Sadly, uh, though, I kind of understand because we do not need Cuba's contacts, one of them to be Russia, to be knocking on our door anytime soon. Oh yeah, as far as why we wouldn't help. Uh, Dan, I know I can disagree with you on a lot of things, but our mutual disdain for uh, communism government control is much appreciated, especially when one of us has actual family never got to come home to us here in the States. Something like this was very important for me to hear because while there are a lot of groups that want what Cuba has, uh, because all they see are a bunch of stats, what they don't see is how they got those stats. I'm all up for progress, but we have to be realistic. The only reason why there was a drop in prison population, for example, in the early 60s when Castro came in was because he put him on a boat and sent him to Miami. Uh, which is the reason why there was a spike in crime from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Not to mention the drug trade booming at the time. Thanks for all you do. Hope you can talk more about historic figures that a group idolizes that need to be shown why they're really a piece of shit. Apologize for the length, but never the girth. Three out of five stars. Would definitely recommend. P.S. I just became a dad about four months ago, and I'm not going to lie. This is a lot more tough than I thought. I've been looking up on how to be more caring and nurturing. we we'll also want to be a better father figure than what I grew up with. Today, we get along pretty well. My dad and me, uh, not my son, He's very adorable. Definitely loves his mom more. Any advice that I can get for how to be a good dad in the beginning, how to learn to be patient, but fair, understanding, basically anything you can do that would let my son know that I'm going to bust your balls, but I love you anyway. Anything would do. Thank you. P.S. Congrats on raising two wonderful children, being a dad. I uh, hope to be as cool as you. Oh man, you want to be cooler than me. Uh, working the long hours to support the family when my wife takes care of our kid is grueling, but I'm hoping that getting back into my field after missing it for so long and working on trucks, I can build a better future for my family Love you, dude. Frankie. Oh, man, Frankie, love you too, man. Congrats on becoming a father. Uh, kudos to you for being willing to, to work your ass off to provide for your family. Uh, my advice for fatherhood, you're not going to be able to be there as much as you want to be if you're the provider. You're not going to be able to show up for every game. Very unlikely. Every bedtime story, every milestone because you're working your ass off to provide a better life for them. So when you can be there, be there. Be present Don't be on your phone. Uh, Be tuned into them. Try not to let your mind wander to work and all that shit. Try to be really truly there. Make whatever moments you get count. You can't give, uh, you know, them too many hugs is something I would advise as well. You can't tell them you love them too many times. When they do something great that makes you feel really proud of them, don't just think it. Say it. Let them know. And also, yeah, don't be afraid to discipline them. And let them know why you're disciplining them. Because it's your job to help make them the best humans they can be. Good parental discipline doesn't come from a place of anger, hate. I mean, you can be mad as fuck. You will be. But it still should come from a place of love, right? I love you so much. 
I'm willing to have you be mad at me. I'm willing to see you be sad because I don't want you to be another fuck up out there making the world worse off. I want you to be better than that. Have honor, integrity, make the world a better place. You know, be happier because you know you are helping make the world a better place because now you can see how others are fucking up. One more thing, even though I can spend hours talking about all this, be kind to yourself. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. We all do. Your kids are going to know, you know, you're some fallible human someday. They're going to be mad at you for this or that. You know, it happens to the best of us and that's okay. And yeah, on Castro, fuck that guy. <laughs> I would love communism to work. We all get to share in the wealth. Everything's fair and equal, right? But the world has been a battle for resources always. It's never been about sharing equally. And I don't think it ever will be. It'd be sweet. It's a nice dream, but I think it's just that a dream. Uh, I'm against it, not because I'm not humanist. I'm against it because I am humanist. Capitalism, far from a perfect system. I would love to see some socialist policies, you know, like a certain level of free healthcare, you know, offered everyone be integrated into our capitalist system. But even without that, uh, you know, our version of capitalism, far better than communism. Thank you again, Frankie. Uh, last up, the man I dedicated the show to, probably one of Nimrod's favorite meat sacks, a bright light in a dark world, a champion of a human, Kevin Thompson, who writes, Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, glory be to Bojangles. What's up, Dan? My name is Kevin. I'm a huge fan of your Time Suck podcast. Huge fan of uh, you and Lin Lindsay, actually. I was turned on to your podcast by a coworker. Quickly spread the word to all of my employees on our second shift. I am the second shift warehouse supervisor for a women's footwear company, e-commerce division. Side note, does Lindsay like shoes slash sandals, boots, clogs, et cetera? What size and where can I send them? Oh, it's so nice. Uh, uh, you have to have Lindsay reach out. I don't know if you uh, mentioned names, but the company is White Mountain Footwear. Fucking boom, mentioned. Totally cool if you don't. But have Lindsay take a look seriously. White Mountain Footwear. I'm um, writing to you mostly to say thank you. If emailing you is the wrong way to do this, well, shit, my bad. It's not. It's the perfect way. Uh, but I love time suck at work or on long road trips like I'm preparing for tomorrow. I'm going to download a couple episodes right now for the trip. My soon-to-be wife getting married on Saturday. Myself and two of my coworkers also recently traveled from New Hampshire to see you do stand-up in Burlington, Vermont. Fucking hilarious, bro. We loved it. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was diagnosed last June 2023 with metastatic... Wait, meta, yeah, metastatic small cell lung cancer. Unfortunately, a terminal diagnosis. And very recently, my prognosis took a turn for the worse. The cancer is in my lungs, liver, bones, lymph nodes, and now my brain. I have an amazing cancer team fighting for me and I will never give up. But it was made very clear to me that I need to plan for the end of my life now. Although difficult, what a blessing. I mean, how many people actually get to plan their own funeral? I'm curious your thoughts on that. I'm also a recovered alcoholic, not cured. By recovered, I mean recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. God willing, I will be able to celebrate five years of sobriety, April 28th. I'm a spiritual man, not religious. I've dedicated my life outside of work for the last five years to helping other alcoholics and addicts. And one of the ways I do that is by trying to reduce the stigma that surrounds addicts and alcoholics in the workplace. I spearheaded the actions to get my employer recognized as a recovery-friendly workplace. This is a New Hampshire initiative to provide resources to employees and their families and provide a safe environment for employees to be honest about their situation and get help if needed without the risk of losing their jobs. 60% of the employees I hired on my shift are in recovery from drugs or alcohol, and all of my employees are the most stellar coworkers I've ever had the privilege to work with. That being said, maybe I could send a shout out to my employees that listen to you on a regular basis. We all listen to you while we work the evenings away and discuss the episodes with each other. Their names are Didi, Jeremy, Mamie, Tim, Jojo, and Brando. And Mel, Tim, too. Ha <laughs> ha. Julia, Jeb, and Rob may listen uh, also, but I'm not sure. Again, thank you for what you do and your whole team. I can't imagine the amount of work that goes into every episode. Hope I get the chance to see you perform in person again. Much love, Kevin Thompson. Kevin, goddamn, man. Uh, did you sprinkle some fucking pollen or maybe pet dander into this email? Uh, for some reason, the first time uh, I, I read it, whoo, uh, severe allergic reaction. I love, I love the energy from you, the positivity that comes through in this message. I've also thought that there are uh, a lot of people, or I've always thought, excuse me, always thought that there are a lot of people who, you know, are, are technically live really long lives, but they never really lived. I can tell that you are fucking living. You are so alive, right? These people, they existed in miserable downtrodden ways, you know, moving through their life as if they're stuck on some shitty fucking hamster wheel, complaining about the same things, never doing anything about it, never do anything to try and make the world a better place, never put in the work to do something like not just working on their own recovery from alcohol abuse, but also working to help others recover it as well, even in your current state. You, Kevin, you are fucking something, man. You care, you love, you help. You're a spiritual man, me too. Like you, not religious, but spiritual. A little more spiritual all the time. 
And, and I do think, not that you asked for this, but man, I think there's something else out there for us. I can tell that you do too. You know, uh, I, I hope you have a miraculous recovery. If you don't, then I guess, you know, you'll just get to that next dimension a little quicker. Some of the rest of us, I hope to see you there someday and hug it out. As far as your coworkers go, yeah, happy to give a shout out to those drunk junkies. <laughs> just kidding. Happy to give a shout out to them. I had to enough for myself. Didi, Jeremy, Mamie, Tim, Jojo, Brando, Maybe, Mel, Tim too, Julia, Jeb, and Rob. Don't you fucking let Kevin down, right? Even if I swing by and I'm fucking hammered and also high as fuck, I want to see you crack. But for real, good on all of you. Now go suck Kevin's dick. All of you. Uh, a memory, so we can have a memory train. I want you to run a train on Kevin so we can run a memory train later. Build a human period or something, figure out the dick sucking, and then a train. And last thing. Uh, since you do get to plan your own funeral, Kevin, you have to insist on a catapult. You have to raise money and make it happen. Load the Kevin. Aim the Kevin. Fire the Kevin. Pretty fucked up. But also, that would be the most epic send-off literally of all time. Hail Nimrod, everyone. Especially you, Kevin. Uh, I'm gonna go take some allergy meds. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Focusing. Uh, thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death and time suck each week. Short sucks and nightmare fuel on the time suck and scared to death podcast feed some weeks. Write your dreams down this week. Look for clues that you've been displaced in time. See if you can find special messages in your dreams. Please write into the show if that message is to keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. There is a fourth dimension that is known to man, but not fully understood. It is a dimension of time, and as timeless as infinity. It lies between and also fully encompasses the present, past, and future. It is a dimension between science and superstition. A dimension of souls we perceive as ghosts and precognition we receive as dreams. It is a dimension that lies just beyond the human capability for imagination. And today, we explored it in an area I now like to call the Time Suck Zone. <laughs> 